Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this second day of the conference in honor of uh, Alessio Figalli. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, our first speaker, uh, Robert McCann from the University of Toronto. Uh, we all know him very well uh, for his work, uh, outstanding work on uh, calculus of variation, transport, and nonlinear PDEs. But today we'll talk about displacement convexity of Boltzmann entropy characterizes positive energy in general relativity. Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, I'd also like to thank Luigi and the organizers for doing the great job that they always do. Um, I've been coming to Pisa since the, I think the very first meeting in Optimal Transport in 2000 I co-organized, but uh, uh, I've been coming back every two or three years since then. Um, it's always uh, illuminating to be here. I'd also like to thank Alessio Figali for winning the Fields Medal and providing the occasion for all of us to get together. Um, Italy has been waiting a long time for its second Fields Medalist, but Optimal Transport has also been waiting a while for its first Fields Medalist, especially since uh, Optimal Transport was not mentioned in the citation of Cedric Villani eight years ago. Um, and I've known Alessio since he was a PhD student, which is not that long ago. And uh, I remember the first, in the 2006 meeting on optimal transport in Pisa, I was here with my collaborator, Peter Topping, and uh, we, we were working on Ricci flow at that time, and we discussed a little bit with Alessio, and Peter said, you know, I can't work out whether it would be a good idea to have him come to Warwick or not, or whether he'll just drive me crazy with questions. Um, so I'm very happy that I, I uh, took the chance and invited Alessio to Toronto uh, the year that he defended his PhD, and we began a very fruitful collaboration on this regularity of optimal mappings uh, together with Jung Hyun Kim, but also uh, we worked at IPAM in 2008. We started working on optimal economic decision making when you're interacting with uh, agents who have private information about themselves. So that was a very pressing problem at the time. Uh, it may no longer be such a pressing problem in the future when Google and Facebook and Amazon know more about our preferences than we know ourselves, but, uh, but at that time there was still private information in the world. And um, my most recent PhD student and I followed up that work by uh, extending it considerably, Shuang Zhang Zhang, to consider the case where different people have different sensitivities to price. So that's a much more realistic model than the model that I worked on with Alessio. And so I had a difficult choice in determining what I should talk about at this meeting. Uh, so I could have talked about economics. I ended up deciding to talk about physics. Um, and I have to apologize to Alessio and a couple of other people in the audience who've heard me speak about the preliminary, preliminary version of this work before. Also, um, my web page is on the slides. If you click on the talk button, you get a version of the slides. Um, and I also wanted to dedicate the talk today to uh, Professor Kazumaza Kuwata, a member of our community who uh, passed away unexpectedly and whose work partly inspires the developments I'm going to describe. So um, there are two famous sign laws in physics. One of them is that gravity is always attractive, never repulsive. And uh, the other one is that entropy always goes up and never down. And so it, uh, part of the genesis of this project was wondering whether these two things might somehow be related to each other or manifestations of the same underlying geometric reality. And uh, there's some evidence, although this is, might be a little surprising, there's some evidence from the physics community since the work of Bekenstein that uh, gravity and thermodynamics are closely related. So in the early 1970s, uh, Bekenstein observed that uh, under gravitational interactions of black holes, the surface area of their horizons can only go up. And so he hypothesized that the surface area was, represented the entropy of the black hole. And um, 20 years later, Jacobson realized that uh, if you take that as an assumption that the surface area of the black hole horizon represents its entropy, you can derive the Einstein equations from, uh, the, from the laws of thermodynamics. And more recently, Eric Verlind has proposed that gravity is actually not a fundamental force at all but is rather an emergent entropic statistical force. And uh, so he, um, he actually makes, he has a theory that makes slightly different predictions from general relativity and that seems to be borne out pretty well in the data. So, um, so my purpose today is to describe a new uh, connection between gravity and entropy, uh, which is mo mediated by optimal transport. Um, so I talked about gravity being attractive. Let me discuss what the basis for that is. Of course, in Newton's theory, um, force is proportional to the gradient of a potential, and the potential satisfies Poisson's equation. 
And the right-hand side of Poisson's equation is non-negative, and so it's that non-negativity that tells us that gravity is attractive. Of course, Newton was not able to explain everything with his uh, theory, and in particular, he wasn't able to explain why the gravitational mass, which is sort of the charge that gra uh, gravitating particles interact with, was the same as the inertial mass, which is, um, which is the extent to which bodies uh, resist changing their state of motion. And so, he, in fact, he wasn't able to explain this local experiment that happened several, uh, that's alleged to have happened several hundred years ago in Pisa, where Galileo dropped the two different masses from the top of the tower and they landed at the bottom at the same time. Einstein's theory does predict this because Einstein's theory is a geometric theory of gravity, which basically says the particles aren't really interacting with each other. Independent of their mass, they're just following the straightest line in the curved space-time that they can. And if you're not familiar with this theory, there's a, here's a caricature of how um, uh, a force might be, uh, geometry might be masquerading as a force. So imagine you send two missiles directly south from the equator, and now uh, we believe the Earth is round, and so that the missiles will pass very close to each other at the South Pole, and come back up, separate, and then come back up and pass close to each other again at the North Pole. If you thought the Earth was flat, and you observed these missile trajectories, you would see that they pass close to each other, and then they move away, and then they pass close to each other again, and you would say, well, they must be, they must be attracted to each other because they overshoot, and then the, somehow the attraction pulls them back together. And um, Einstein wrote a basic equation for how this interaction would operate, and I think of this equation as saying that geometry equals physics. So on the left-hand side of the equation, you have the Einstein tensor, which is a four by four matrix at each point of space-time, and it basically measures curvature. It measures the average sectional curvature in a given direction minus some multiple of the same quantity averaged over all directions. And Einstein's equation, I guess it should be eight pi, so there's a typo on this slide in the next one, rather than 16 pi says that this, this four by four curvature matrix is proportional to a four by four physical matrix that tells you the flux of energy and momentum in each of the four directions in space time. So it's called the stress energy tensor. And um, the, uh, the theory posits that gravity takes place on a four dimensional manifold, but uh, it's, not a, it's not a Ramanian manifold in the sense that when you measure distances or uh, lengths of vectors, some vectors have positive lengths because they point in into the future or past, and other vectors have negative lengths because they point into directions that no physical particle can move, the elsewhere. Um, so here's an example due to Kip Thorne of how, the, how to think about the Einstein equation. So imagine you're the captain of a spaceship, and you're sent to investigate the geometry near a black hole, and so you put your spaceship into orbit around the black hole, and you're orbiting the hole with your feet pointing towards it and your head pointing away from it. And as long as the mass of you and the spaceship is negligible, then uh, the Einstein equation is going to say that uh, locally this average sectional curvature is equal to zero. And um, so, what that, of course, the average of the sectional curvature is you're moving forward through time and you're averaging the sectional curvatures over time across the three directions of space. And so, um, what will you feel? As you orbit the black hole, if the hole is massive enough and your orbit is close enough to the horizon, you're going to feel your head and feet stretched away from each other, and you're going to feel your front and back pressed towards each other, and your left and right side pressed towards each other. And the Einstein equation in vacuum says that the sum of these three forces is going to be equal, uh, and so that the, uh, the stretching you feel is going to be twice as strong as the compression you feel around your waist because of the axial symmetry around your waist. And uh, of course, it's not that your head is repelling your feet, it's just that your head and your feet are trying to follow different parallel geodesics in a curved space time, and so the geodesics are separating from each other. Okay, so why should Einstein's theory predict that gravitational attractions, uh, uh, interactions are going to be attractive? Um, okay, so let me, let me describe a bit more about the, uh, the setting for Einstein's theory first, and then we'll come back to why is gravity attractive. So Einstein's theory is set on a uh, four-dimensional, but uh, more generally an n-dimensional Lorentzian manifold. And so what it means to be Lorentzian is that at each point on the tangent space, you have a metric tensor that tells you the, uh, the angle between any two vectors, but, um, but again, certain vectors have positive lengths and certain vectors have negative lengths, and I'm gonna take the, uh, I'm gonna make the convention that there's one positive direction and n minus one negative directions. And so at each point x, you have a light cone, which I tried to draw in green and, uh, uh, green and red. And in fact, the light cone will be separated into a future part, that's the green part, and a red part, which is the past, past cone. 
So vectors inside the light cone are time-like, vectors vectors outside the light cone are space-like, and vectors on the light cone are called either uh, uh, light-like or null vectors. So here's, uh, here's my terminology. Um, vectors which are either time-like or light-like are also called causal, and uh, they can be future-directed or past-directed, but as in elementary geometry where you have Möbius strips, it's possible to construct manifolds where you can't have a global choice of future and past. I'm gonna assume that you do have a global, a global continuous choice of future and past on my manifold. And whenever I have a smooth manifold or a different, uh, sorry, a smooth curve on the manifold, it's gonna be said to be time-like if its tangent vector is always time-like or light-like or space-like or causal if its tangent vector is always light-like or space-like or causal or future-directed or past-directed. Okay, so what makes gravity attractive? So in Newton's equation, it was that the mass density was non-negative. In the Einstein equation, it's some kind of positive definiteness that you make on this curvature tensor. And there are different positivity conditions that one can hypothesize, and uh, both, there's actually three or four, maybe more. Um, these were explored by Hawking and Penrose in the late 60s and early 1970s. So there's the so-called weak energy condition asks that, um, for every time-like vector on the manifold, the inner product of that vector with itself under the Einstein curvature tensor is non-negative. That's believed to be satisfied in all physical geometries. There's also a thing called the strong energy condition, which, at least in the absence of cosmological constant, asks that the Ricci tensor of every time-like vector with itself uh, evaluates to something non-negative. And, of course, the relationship between the Einstein and the Ricci tensor is written here on this slide. Um, and uh, the R that appears, the, the, aver the subtraction of a multiple of the average sectional curvature is the scalar curvature that appears is the trace of the Ricci tensor. So although the strong energy condition is known to be violated in some exotic physical geometries, uh, it's, uh, it's the guy that implies that gravity is attractive, and it was used by Hawking and Penrose to show that um, if you have what's called a trapped space-like surface, then you're uh, such as a horizon of a black hole, then your space time is necessarily going to contain singularities. And if we come back to our caricature of our spaceship uh, exploring black hole geometry, the strong energy condition would tell us that, or the weak energy condition would tell us that, um, that instead of adding up to zero, these three forces add up to something non-negative, so the overall effect on you is one of uh, average compression rather than stretching. Um, I'm also going to make this technical assumption on the Lorentzian manifolds that I deal with, which is uh, its kind of compactness assumption, local compactness. Um, and it says that in addition to being smooth, connected, Hausdorff, and time-like orientable, there are no closed future-directed curves on my manifold. And also, if I fix any two events, x and y, and I look at all of the points in the future of x and all of the points in the past of y, their intersection is compact. And on this n-dimensional manifold, I'm going to introduce uh, the following Lagrangian function, which turns out remarkable on the tangent space, which turns out to be convex. And um, basically, uh, I fix some parameter between zero and one, and I'm going to choose a Lagrangian function which is only finite in the future directions. It's gonna be plus infinity everywhere else. And in each future uh, causal direction, I take the Lagrangian to be the qth power of the norm of the vector, the, the Lorentz norm of the vector in that direction, with an overall negative sign to make it convex. So when q is equal to one, this is actually homogeneous of degree one. It's negative inside the future cone, zero on the boundary, uh, and it jumps to plus infinity outside. But because it's positive homogeneous of degree one, it's not strictly convex. When I raise it to a power between zero and one, it becomes strictly convex, except at least on the interior of the future cone. Of course, it's still zero on the boundary of the future cone. And it has a, a very natural dual uh, convex Hamiltonian, at least if Q is strictly less than one, which is, turns out to be the Qth prime power of the norm of a dual vector, but the dual vector has to be past directed, where Q prime is the holder conjugate of Q. Now, of course, because Q is between zero and one, Q prime is negative. Um, and I've drawn a sketch for what, these, uh, what this Lagrangian looks like in green on the right and what the Hamiltonian looks like in red on the left. And of course, they're both plus infinity in the, uh, in the area in between that you see on the curve. Um, so you can look at, if you have a curve on your manifold, you can uh, look at the action of the curve with respect to this Lagrangian. 
and um, you can try to minimize that action. Of course, the action will be plus infinity unless the curve is timelike and future directed. So I'm only interested in timelike future directed curves. And among such curves, I try to, given two fixed endpoints, x and y, I can try to minimize the action. And the thing that I get is sometimes called the Lorentz distance up to this leading minus sign, which I've introduced to make the Lorentz distance positive instead of negative. Now, of course, the Lorentz distance is only non-negative if y is in the future of x. Otherwise, it will be minus infinity with this, with this sign convention. And Jensen's inequality tells you that although I've selected this parameter q between 0 and 1, the curve which minimizes the action is going to be independent of q, and I can relate the, ac the qth action with the 1th action uh, using this simple formula. And the 1th action is familiar in the theory of general relativity. It's called the, either the Lorentz distance or the time separation function. And physically, we interpret it as the maximum amount that a particle can age when passing from the point x to the point y. So if you think about the twin paradox, it's the twin, if you're familiar with the twin paradox from special relativity, it's the twin that stays in place that ages more than the twin that races away to the edge of the universe and comes back quickly. And that's because geodesics represent the maximum change in proper time between two given points in space-time. And um, throughout this talk, I'm going to adopt the convention that minus infinity to any power is minus infinity, uh, so that the middle formula would not be correct without this convention, and it's going to be convenient for other reasons as well, for other purposes as well. So because the Lagrangian is convex, the time separation function uh, satisfies, because of the minus sign introduced, a backwards triangle inequality. So given any three events, x, y, and z, the time elapsed between x and z plus the time elapsed between z and y is less than the time elapsed, the maximum time elapsed between x and y. And the global, the compactness assumption that I made on my manifold, global hyperbolicity, ensures that there is a minimum action curve as long as it's possible to, for positive time to elapse between x and y. And uh, those curves are called geodesic segments, and basically they produce equality that, in the triangle inequality. So you can also express them in this way. You can say a geodesic segment is a curve parameterized over the unit interval such that the, on any two sub, any points in the interior of the unit interval, the time elapsed between them passing along the curve is proportional to the total time elapsed passing along the curve with a proportionality constant por proportional to the time elapsed between the two sub points. And other than my choices of sign and the sign restrictions on these curves, this is entirely analogous to the construction of the shortest length curves which achieve the Riemannian distance in the case of a positive definite metric G tilde on M. And in fact, whenever you have a globally hyperbolic Lorentz manifold, it turns out you can also put a Riemannian metric on it and that's convenient for, to do analysis, to, do, to push some of the analysis through. Um, of course, in the positive definite case, it's also convenient to look at, to not just look at the norm of the vector, but rather we typically look at the norm of squared of the vector to minimize the energy when we want to define geodesics because that ensures the geodesics are going to be arc length parameterized. In the Lorentzian case, minimizing these fractional powers of the Lorentz norm is exactly analogous. It ensures the minimizing curves are arc length or proper time parameterized. Um, so in the Riemannian case, what is, let me say a little bit, what is curvature? Um, let me beg the indulgence of the geometers in the audience to, uh, so if I take any two curves, sigma parameterized by S and tau parameterized by T, that coincide at when S is equal to T, and I compute the distance squared between, the Riemannian distance squared between sigma of S and tau of T, to leading order, Pythagoras' theorem tells me the answer, and um, at, at the, the next correction to that turns out to be at fourth order in the parameters S and T, and uh, so I have this fourth order multilinear object and the coefficient of that correction is exactly the Riemann curvature tensor up to a constant which I think is six. And so in other words, basically what this tensor does, what this four index tensor does is measure the leading order correction to Pythagoras' law. And uh, it's more common in differential geometry to define it as measuring the failure of covariant derivatives to commute with each other, but these are, definitions are equivalent. And if I take the trace of this four index object on two indices, I get the Ricci tensor, which is what appeared in the Einstein equation. Um, so in exact analogy with the, these definitions, you can, on, given a Lorentzian metric, you can define uh, 
a Riemannian curvature tensor associated with that Lorentz metric. And so I drew the Riemannian picture here. So these are my curves sigma and tau are in blue and green, and the distance between two points in them that you're trying to measure is in red. And um, so if I make the analogous definitions for a Lorentzian metric, um, uh, then basically what I said a few slides ago is that the attractivity of gravity stems from the positive definiteness of the Ricci tensor, at least in time-like directions. So now let me try, so much for gravity, let me try to say what this might have to do with entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so the next part of the talk is strongly inspired by developments in the Ramanian setting, which many people in the audience have contributed to. Um, so going back to my work with Cordero, Rauskin, and Schmuckenschlager 20 years ago, um, uh, and even my thesis before that, uh, we were able to show that when you're on a reaching non-negative manifold, if you take two probability measures on that manifold and you construct, you lift the distance from the manifold to the space of probability measures using optimal transport, so you construct the two, the L2 Kanarovich, Rubinstein, Wasserstein geodesic between two probability measures, then the, uh, uh, if you're in Euclidean space, my thesis showed that the Boltzmann entropy and other entropies were convex as a function of time along the GS geodesic curve. With Cordero and Schmuckenschlager, I was able to show that this is also true in a reaching non-negative setting, as conjectured by Otto and Villani at about the same time. And a few years after that, von Renessa and Sturm uh, realized that this was an if and only if characterization. So in other words, uh, this convexity will only be true if you're on a reaching non-negative manifold. And somehow that was the beginning of a very fruitful uh, line of work started by Sturm, Lott, and Villani, uh, to which uh, people in the audience, including Ambrosio, Jigli, Savari, and also Urbar, Quada, and Sturm, who are not here today, um, have contributed much. Um, they basically, what they did was they said, suppose I want to define what it means to have a Ricci curvature bound, but I'm not on a smooth manifold. I'm only in a metric space where I have a distance function and in order to define geodesics on points and also on probability measures, and I have a reference measure in order to define an entropy function, then I take the convexity of that entropy along geodesics as the definition of what it means to be Ricci bounded below, and if the convexity is uniform, or maybe you have uniform semi-convexity, I take what that as a definition of what it means for the Ricci to have a non-zero, Ricci tensor to have a non-zero lower bound. And this has been a very fruitful theory, uh, it turns out that a lot of theorems that are true on manifolds under reaching non-negative or reaching lower bounds uh, can also be extended to the metric measure setting, perhaps with some additional assumptions. Uh, some highlights of that theory are that, um, you know, things like the Bonnet-Myers diameter bound holds, that's a result of lott Villani and also Sturm. You have a splitting, you have an analog of the chigur gromel splitting theorem due to Jigli and rigidity results. Uh, you have comparison theorems for isoparametric profiles. And in fact, whenever you have one of these metric spaces in a lower bound and Ricci curvature, Mondino and Neighbor will tell you that uh, you can cover such a space with Lipschitz coordinate charts at least almost everywhere. So somehow there's a very rich theory. And today's talk is sort of the first, I think, a first attempt to develop such a theory in the context of space time rather than simply space. So, how can I do something, how can one do, attempt to do something similar to this in the Lorentzian space-time setting? So the first thing we need to do is we need to lift the, uh, the geometry from the space of events, from the space-time events to the set of probability measures on space-time. And I'm going to use the Lorentz distance to do that, or the time separation function. Uh, but I'm going to use a fractional power, so Q between zero and one. And so given any two probability measures, mu naught and mu one, let's take them to have compact support for simplicity on my space-time manifold. I can try to correlate them so as to maximize the expected proper time between mu naught every event x and the partner event y under mu one. And so how do I correlate them? I use a joint measure, which I've denoted by gamma on this slide. It's a joint probability measure, so it's non-negative on the product of the manifold with itself. And it if I project it onto the first copy of the manifold, I see the given dis the initial distribution mu naught. If I project it onto the second copy, I see the final distribution mu one. And among such joint measures that have these fixed marginal projections, I try to maximize the ex the expectation of the proper time elapsed if q is equal to one, or some other power of the proper time when q is between zero and one. And if I take the qth root of that maximum, what I get is something that I'm going to call the LQ distance between these probability measures. 
So this is a, exactly, an opt, apart from choice of signs, it's an optimal transport problem formulated in the language of Kantorovich from 1942. And uh, however, the, the cost function LQ that I'm trying to maximize, or negative LQ that I would be trying to minimize, is a singular cost because it jumps to infinity outside the future cone, outside the, the causal, the pairs of points which uh, a particle can pass through both events. And also the gradient diverges at the boundary of this causal set. And uh, so you have to, if you want to analyze this problem, you have to cope with these singularities. And in some sense, the singularities in L and LQ reflect the degeneration of both strict convexity and smoothness for the Guangxian at the light cone. Nevertheless, uh, LQ is still upper semi-continuous, and so the supremum is still attained by some gamma, and I'm going to call it LQ optimal, unless the LQ measure, unless mu naught and mu one are not causally related, in which case their LQ distance can be minus infinity. And just as in the Ramanian case, it turns out this distance between probability measures inherits the triangle inequality, or the backwards triangle inequality from the time separation function L. So this, this so actually I have to say that these, these distances on measures were proposed a couple of years ago by Eckstein and Miller, uh, as I learned after I, when I was writing this paper. And, um, but uh, the definition that I'm about to propose is new. Uh, so we say that a, a, a curve in the space of probability measures is a Q geodesic if it produces equality in this backwards triangle inequality. So in other words, if as a function of its parameter, it divides the total time elapsed between any intermediate measure mu s and mu t into a fraction t minus s of the total time elapsed between the initial measure and the, final, the total maximum time elapsed, expected maximum time elapsed between the initial and the final measure, mu naught and mu one. And it turns out that these QG desics exist in fair generality, and we're going to um, always under the assumption that mu naught in some sense lies in the future of mu one, and we're going to be able to characterize them at least um, unique and show they're unique at least under some hypotheses on mu naught and mu one, and in particular, we need, want one of, if we want uniqueness of the geodesic, we'd better have one of the endpoint measures to be absolutely continuous with respect to the Lorentzian volume, which I've written in coordinates at the bottom of the slide. So, okay, so this, is based, this slide describes how I lift the geometry of space-time events, which is encoded in the time separation function L, to a geometry on the space of probability measures on space-time events, I also need to describe how do I construct the entropy on such probability measures. And basically, uh, you fix either the Lorentzian volume or if you like some, some multiple of it, which I've, the, the factor in front of it is e to the minus v, where v is some potential. And then you look at all measures which are absolutely continuous with respect to uh, Ramanian volume. You write their density with respect to this fixed measure, reference measure as rho, and you define the boltzmann shannon integral rho log rho entropy against the reference measure m. And of course, the most interesting case for us will be v equals zero, in which case this is the classical boltzmann shannon entropy from information theory and thermodynamics. But notice that our sign convention is opposite to the physicist's entropy. So in other words, um, if, if my measure is very concentrated, the entropy that I've defined is going to be large, whereas the physical entropy would be rather negative because, uh, uh, because there's not a lot of disorder if the entropy is very, if the measure is very concentrated. And so I'm now in a position where I can state the first main theorem of the talk, which is that I'm going to characterize the positive energy, the, the strong energy condition from general relativity in terms of a statement about convexity of the entropy, which I've just introduced along these space-time geodesics in probability measures. And so uh, here's the statement, fix this parameter, this exponent between zero and one, Q, and a globally hyperbolic space-time. If you can find a unit vector where the Ricci curvature is negative or less than some real value K, then you can construct one of these Q geodesics among probability measures, and it will be supported very close to the, the point where you have this uh, time-like vector violating your Ricci curvature bound, um, such that uh, the entropy along that geodesic is either fails to be convex if the lower bound is zero, or fails to be less than Q times the expected time elapsed between the two measures mu naught and mu one squared otherwise. And uh, so this, this uh, factor of L squared uh, just tells me that I've chosen to parameterize my geodesic over the unit interval instead of, the, instead of parameterizing it over the interval zero L, where L is the amount of time that elapses between the initial and the final measure. And also my geodesic has this additional property that um, 
L, the, the time separation is strictly positive on the entire support of the product measure mu naught and mu one. So that's actually the easy statement to prove. And the more interesting statement is the converse. So if you have a Ricci lower bound for every time-like vector, uh, and notice there's some additional hypothesis here relative to the uh, Ramanian case, so I need the Ricci lower bound k to actually be non-negative. Then, in fact, the entropy will be convex along, distributionally at, along all q geodesics, provided the endpoints of the geodesics are measures with finite entropy, and provided that the uh, time separation function is strictly positive on the product of the initial and final density. And in case, in case k is strictly positive, you get a stronger statement. Uh, you get that kl squared is a lower bound for your Hessian of your entropy with respect to the curve parameter. And so maybe I should, so basically, uh, let me, this last line here puts this additional restriction the, uh, that every mu naught almost every point x is in the past of mu one almost every point y, and that additional restriction is basically keeping you away from the singularities in the time separation function L. Um, however, it's not a very convenient restriction uh, for the following reason, so I've reproduced a figure here from, uh, from Villani's book, which is inspired by my thesis. So imagine you have a distribution of gas at time zero and a distribution of gas at time one. Here we're in Euclidean space instead of Lorentzian space. And you try, to, uh, you try to minimize the average squared Euclidean distance between the, particle, the initial particles gas and the final particles of gas. So then basically what you produce is a set of curves which satisfy, which give a Lagrangian description of a solution to the pressureless Euler equation. And because you're in Euclidean space or because you're on a reaching non-negative manifold, it turns out that if you ask where are the particles of gas at time one half between zero and one, it turns out that on average they're more spread out than they were initially or finally, so that the, the geodesics are, uh, have moved away from each other and are gonna come back together later. So that's the signature of reaching non-negativity. If I did this experiment on the sphere, I would see that the effect is even more exaggerated because uh, parallel geodesics are tending to converge at their endpoints. If I did it on the saddle, I would see the opposite. So in other words, on the sphere, the mathematical entropy is smaller in the middle. The physical entropy is larger because the particles are more spread out. If I have two mass distributions on either side of a saddle and I try to pair them together so as to minimize average distance transported, all the particles need to go through the saddle at the middle and so the gas becomes more concentrated. The mathematical entropy is larger so I can't have convexity. The physical entropy is smaller in the middle. Um, so, I stated the, I characterized the strong energy condition in terms of this entropic convexity statement. There's a sort of souped up version of this where I allow the reference measure to be different from the Lorentzian volume by some exponent minus V, where V is a potential on the manifold. So just as in the Ramanian case, you can define this kind of modified Ricci curvature tensor, which is sometimes called the n bakri emery tensor by adding the Hessian of V to the Ricci curvature and subtracting some multiple of the gradient of V squared, where the multiple depends on a coefficient, which is sometimes called a dimension parameter, capital N. And so here's a souped up version of the theorem. Um, if this modified Ricci tensor is bounded above by K in all time-like directions, then there's a geodesic in the space, a Q geodesic in the space of measures along which this modified entropy that I get by taking uh, e to the minus v times the Lorentzian volume to be my resonance measure uh, fails to be convex, fails to be uniformly k-convex. And conversely, if this modified Ricci tensor is, has a non-negative lower bound in every time-like direction, then this modified uh, entropy, so there should be a sub v on the e in the second formula, um, satisfies this strong inequality enhanced in the case where k is positive, and that holds along every geodesic, every q geodesic in the space of measures. And I said having finitely separated, uh, finite entry Q separated endpoints. So let me go back to the picture for a second. So in the lazy gas experiment, uh, if I try to do this in Lorentz space with time pointing to the left instead of Euclidean space, and I want to avoid the singularities associated with the light cone, then it's important that uh, you know every particle on the right and its partner on the left be joined by a line whose slope is less than 45 degrees. Now that can be true at time one, 
but it's less likely to be true at time, if I compare time zero to time one half, and it's surely violated if I compare time zero to time epsilon. In other words, there'll be some particles initially which are gonna be not uh, causally related to other particles in the mass distribution at any time positive epsilon. And so I, I can't make this hypothesis that L is strictly positive and support of the product of both endpoints at all times. That's gonna be a disaster. And so I've introduced this, some alternative hypothesis, which I call Q separation. And so let me tell you about the definition of that in a moment. But, uh, but um, I have some remarks on related developments. So, um, okay, of course, the Ricci tensor is only defined in the smooth setting. But this convexity characterization of the entropy works perfectly well in a metric measure setting, and so you can use it to define a, strong en a sort of strong energy condition in a metric measure setting, provided you have a time separation function that satisfies the backwards inequality, backwards triangle inequality on your metric space, and that I hope to develop in future work. Um, notice also from this theorem that I introduced this artificial parameter, Q, between zero and one to sort of strictly convexify the Lagrangian. It turns out that the smooth manifolds, which satisfy the, uh, you know, if I go back to the theorem, um, the, this condition on the Ricci tensor doesn't depend on Q at all, although the condition on the entropy does depend on Q, the convexity condition on the entropy depends on the Q geodesics. And so at least along smooth manifolds, there's a complete insensitivity to Q. It's not so clear among non-smooth spaces. And I have to say there's some Ramanian version of this where Kell looked at defining curvature dimension conditions not with respect to the Q Wasserstein distance, but with respect to the LP Wasserstein distance for other Ps, it's not so clear whether the, the CDKN P spaces are the same as the CDKN two spaces or not. And um, actually a couple, a few months after I posted my preprint, an independent work uh, appeared by Mondino and Sur, which is closely related, but it uses a localized smooth version of the construction that I've described to give uh, both an upper and lower bound for the Ricci tensor, and so they're able to get a formulation of the full Einstein equation, which I think is extremely interesting. Um, in terms of synthetic approaches to Lorentzian geometry, um, so here I've been talking mostly about Ricci curvature, but of course one can also talk about sectional curvatures, and there's a long history in the 20th century of what it means to have sectional curvature bounds in a metric measure setting due to this, in a, never mind measure, in a metric setting due to the school of Alexandrov, there were analogous theorems in the Lorentzian setting developed, for example, by Alexander and Bishop, and very recently Kunziger and Zaman have uh, used those comparison theorems to give a definition for what it means to, in a metric setting to have, uh, in a Lorentzian metric setting to have sectional curvature bounds. And I can also mention that uh, there was early work by Greg Lopere who observed that displacement and convexity is enhanced under the interaction by Newtonian gravity, which in some sense is the, the classical analog of this geometrical uh, theorem that I'm describing. And there's work by Gomez and Samichi uh, that show that there are other interactions that come up in the theory of the planning problem for mean field games where if you put local congestion interactions, displacement convexity survives. Convexity along these geodesic probability measures. Okay, so let me, I have a little time to talk about the ideas that go into the proof. Um, so uh, those of you familiar with optimal transportation will know that the duality theorem from linear programming plays a key role. And so uh, we defined the LQ distance, which was the expected maximum qth power of the proper time that can elapse between the two distributions mu and nu as a, mac as a maximum over joint probability measures. It's also equal to a minimum, an infimum, over pairs of functions u and v on my manifold, which, whose sum is bounded below by the qth power of the time separation. And um, now if, if this, if this lower bound L was uniformly continuous, then I would know that the infimum is attained by some optimal U and V, but of course the L that I'm dealing with has, is singular and has these jumps to minus infinity, and so it's not so obvious that this infimum is attained in general. And so I need to know that it's attained and I need to be able to work with the functions U and V which attain it, and so I need some hypotheses to be able to do that. So I'm gonna say a pair of measures, mu and nu is Q separated, by gamma u and v satisfying the constraints on these two linear infinite dimensional linear programs, provided that the equality set S for inequality star is contained in the set of points which are time-like future related to each other and contains the support of the measure gamma. So this is sort of a kludge. It's a sort of funny definition 
whose effect is to ensure that minimizing potentials u and v exist. If, if, if mu and nu is q separated by gamma u and v, then gamma will be a maximizer in the Kantorovich problem, u and v will be minimizers in the dual problem. But um, it's a very convenient kludge because not only does it provide dual attainment, um, it turns out that it's a, it's a property that's inherited. This is by somehow following the hamilton jacobi semi group. For this problem, you can show that whenever the endpoints mu naught and mu ones are Q separated and you construct the QG desk between them, the intermediate points on that QG desk will also be Q separated. And a sufficient condition for the endpoints to be Q separated is of course that mu naught every X is in the time-like past of mu one on every Y. So there are lots of pairs of points that are Q separated and we, can, we have a rich family of geodesics along which to test the inequalities. And so under this Q separation hypothesis, I can give a complete characterization of the geodesics, um, which if you know the Ramanian theory, this is exactly analogous to the theory you know. So you fix a parameter strictly between zero and one Q, and you fix a pair of measures which are Q separated by gamma U and V, and as long as one of them, say the first one, is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lorentzian volume, then there's a map of a particular form uh, which describes the unique Q geodesic joining mu naught to mu one, and moreover, every intermediate uh, probability measure on this geodesic will inherit the absolute continuity of the endpoint mu one. Um, and that uh, absolute continuity follows essentially from the uniform convexity of L, but you only have uniform convexity away from the light cone, so the Q separation of the endpoints, using a kind of monge mather theory from dynamical systems. And what I mean, when I say this map describes the intermediate measure, what I mean is that you take all the initial events described by mu naught and you look at their image under the map and the image of those events is a new probability measure and that's the mu s intermediate measure. And I have a figure uh, which, uh, in which I try to reproduce exactly how this map is built. So um, you have a point x which is in the past of a point y and you look at the uh, proper time maximizing geodesic that joins them, call that sigma s. Now, if the point x is supposed to be correlated to the point y under the variational problems that we're studying, then there will be a potential u, and its gradient basically points along the, vec uh, the curve from x to y, or actually in the opposite direction with the sign convention I have. And because we have equality, because x and y produce equality in the inequality that you see at the top of the slide, you have a first and second order condition that you have to satisfy, and from the first order condition, you're able to read off exactly uh, the direction and the length of this geodesic in terms of sigma and the uh, time separation between x and y. So that's the content of this formula that we saw on the preceding page. And um, of course, uh, so if you like the time one, I guess that should be F1 rather than F0 in the middle uh, sentence is a monge map between mu naught and mu one, and it describes the unique Kantorovich uh, maximizer, which defined the LQ distance between mu naught and mu one. And these intermediate measures also satisfy a kind of monge ampere equation, which I've written here, involving the Jacobian of the intermediate time mappings F, where the Jacobian is defined using the approximate derivative of the map. And um, of course, you want to be able to get the entropy inequalities uh, basically, so the spirit, so Alessio uh, and Aldo yesterday talked about using optimal transport to prove um, isoparametric inequalities. And so the spirit of what optimal transport does for you when you're trying to prove a geometric inequality like the isoparametric inequality is that when you find the optimal mapping between two sets or a set and the ball, um, what that optimal mapping is doing for you is it's somehow encoding the global geometry of the sets but the optimal mapping is something you can localize. So you can look at the Jacobian of the map and then you have matrix inequalities for the Jacobian and by integrating these matrix inequalities you can recover global statements about the geometry of the set. It's exactly the same story here except of course because you're in a curved setting the, the, the local inequalities are, are harder to write and more awkward to work with. But again, you need, you need positive definiteness information about the, uh, the determinant of the map and that's somehow encoded in this last line where I said, if you look at the derivative of the map with respect to x, the event x, and you take its time derivative in the formula involving the exponential of s gradient of the Hamiltonian composed with 
gradient of u. Um, you get a product of the second derivative, of the Hessian matrix of the Hamiltonian times the Hessian matrix of u. Now the Hessian matrix of u is symmetric, and the Hessian of the Hamiltonian is positive definite because it's a uniformly convex Hamiltonian, at least in the interior of the past cone, which is where we're working. And uh, it's that positive deafness of the Hamiltonian that makes the geometric inequalities work that tell you the entropy convexity. Um, so again, I have a series of uh, remarks and related developments. So, um, so I made this rather strong hypothesis, which I called Q separation, that said I can correlate mu naught with mu one. I'm only going to look at geodesics joining measures mu naught and mu one, such that I can correlate them, or rather the the, uh, the optimal correlation between them has the property that uh, every um, mu naught almost every x and its partner y are in the time-like future of each other. And somehow this, because the measures are compactly supported, this keeps me away from the light cone and away from the singularities and the costs that I'm trying to optimize. Um, in the initial version of this project, I also said, oh, you can keep things away from the cut locus. This is a great idea, and it was very convenient, and I wrote up a beautiful preprint. And then I, when I started to try to extend this to a non-smooth setting, I realized I have no idea what the cut locus is in a non-smooth setting or how bad it can be. So this is not such a great idea, and I would like to be able to relax these restrictions somewhat. And so it turns out that once you've proven it for this restricted class of measures, you can, you can deal with other measures which can be approximated within this restricted class. And I use ideas of Jiggly where he proved existence of optimal maps in curvature dimension spaces under a non-branching hypothesis to do this relaxation. So I can relax Q separation somewhat. Now I still need that there's some gamma such that the time separation between gamma almost every x and y is strictly positive, but I no longer need this to be uniformly away from the light cone. So in other words, there, the closure could hit the light cone or um, or it could be the case that there are other measures that also optimize some with, involve correlation along light-like geodesics. Um, so I mentioned uh, that solving the dual problem was a key technical step. So actually, uh, again, a few months after my preprint appeared, uh, well, it's actually better than that. So I gave a talk. The first time I described these results in public was at a conference in Banff in April that Alessio was present at. And uh, a week after, so in Banff, all conferences are recorded and placed on video. And a week later, I got an email from Stefan Schur saying, you know, I watched the video of your talk in Banff and it was extremely interesting. And I'm working on a project with Martin Kell to develop a duality theorem for Lorentzian transport. So Schur had already worked a little bit on uh, related problems, the, on the problem with Q equals one and measures which were supported on hyperplanes in Minkowski space or hypersurfaces in curved geometries. And he said, uh, with, with uh, Martin Kell, I have a duality theorem and we're going to write it up as quickly as possible. So they posted their preprint a couple of years after, a couple of months after I did. And um, of course, their work was inspired by earlier work of Brenier, Puel, Fratelli, and Bertrand, among others, on this, what's called the relativistic heat equation. And um, so, there's actually quite general theories for optimal transport with respect to smooth, strictly convex Lagrangians and Hamiltonians. And these were studied by Bernard Buffoni in the Book of Volani, by Fatih and Figali. And then uh, displacement convexity results, so entropic convexity results for the, the geodesics associated with such Lagrangians were studied by Agay, by Ota, Paul Lee, Martin Kell, and Ben Schachter. Um, there hasn't been so much, apart from the work of Schur and the and the things that inspired it, there hasn't been so much on singular Lagrangians, except for the sub Ramanian case, and there are various people in the audience, Ambrosio and Rigaud, uh, Agrachev, Lee, Figali, and Rifford, who have worked on s optimal sub Ramanian transport, and then Lee, Lee, and Zelenko, and Balag, Cristalli, and Sipos have been able to use this optimal sub Ramanian transport in order to uh, prove geometric inequalities. But of course, in the sub Ramanian case, you have a you have a Lagrangian that's singular outside, uh, you know, singular outside a hy uh, hyperplane. Here we have a Lagrangian that's singular outside a cone, so it's a little bit different. And um, my conclusions are that uh, when you want to use optimal transport to encode, uh, to do general relativity, then you want to define geodesics in the set of probability measures that are causally related on space time, and the convenient way to do this is to lift the time separation using fractional powers because uh, if you try to do the time separation itself, it's like solving the Monge problem where you're trying to minimize the Euclidean norm. You know, it's convex, but it's not strictly convex, and this causes no end of suffering. 
as various people in the audience know. Um, so when you use these powers Q, you suddenly improve Lagrangian to something that's smooth and strictly convex, at least away from the light cone. And um, if you want to solve the dual problem in these optimal transportation problems, you, you need to impose some kind of restrictions on the initial and final measure and Q separation. The Q separation that I described is a pretty convenient one to work with. So the convexity properties of Boltzmann's entropy along time-like geodesics of probability measures provides a robust formulation of the strong energy condition of Hawking and Penrose. And also via Mundino and Schur's work, it, it provides a weak formulation of the Einstein field equations, which can be applied in a metric measure setting. And I think that's a very fruitful direction for future research. Um, and of course, it's very interesting. I think it's fit both mathematically and physically interesting to have a setting for Einstein's theory of gravity, which is not a smooth Ramanian man or smooth Lorentzian manifold, particularly because of the singularity theorems in general relativity that say there are quite fairly generic conditions under which we know the smoothness has to break down at some point. And finally, whereas the second law of thermodynamics tells something about the monotonicity of the entropy, so it's encoded in the first time derivative, the Einstein equations of gravity are encoded in the second time derivative of the entropy along these optimal transportation geodesics. So that, I'd like to close with that, and uh, I can congratulate Alessio, and thank you all for your attention. Minor question, but uh, you have the assumption of L strictly positive. Yeah. Um, so how, I don't know, it reminds me a bit in partial transport problem, you had something like that with uh, Luis. Uh, I don't know if, is it kind of related? I mean, you would like to get also greater or equal than zero, right? I mean, you right. want to transport a measure to itself. Right, so, so I think Alessio's question is that I've, somehow I've insisted on dealing with time-like geodesics here. The Lagrangian description of the geodesics between probability measures insists that all the particles follow time-like geodesics. You can also, you can imagine relaxing this to L non-negative, which would mean that a certain fraction of the particles might follow light-like geodesics while the rest of them are following time-like geodesics. In principle, I think that that's doable and it's, but it's much, so the statements become more technical because, for example, the action principle no longer, when you do the action principle for light-like geodesics, it no longer picks out the, the affinely parametrized light like geodesic, because it's not, a, they're all, they all have value zero, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow you start having to put in extra, extra words and extra, so in principle, I think that one should be able to do something like that, but it was an annoyance and I didn't want to have to deal with it. <laughs> but it, I mean, maybe it, maybe it has some physical interest, I don't know. Yes? So, after, if I understood correctly, right, you can formulate the Einstein's equations in this non-smooth setting. Uh, at least Mundino and Schur can formulate the Einstein equations. I can only formulate an Einstein super solution in this non-smooth setting. I see, okay. So, but the question is, uh, do you think that once you're in the non-smooth setting, you can get some new radial solutions that uh, you can study, you know? Ah, uh, new solutions. So I'm not so sure about that. New radial solutions, is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, I know. I mean, radial yeah. solutions are important for... Well, I mean, so in some sense, we already have radial solutions, the Schwarzschild solutions, the Kerr, the Kerr axial solutions, exactly. but they, uh, we have these, um, the ones with electric charge, which are radially symmetric. Um, so in radially symmetric solutions, the, the singularity is always at the origin. Mm -hmm. And um, in, so in some sense, there's a, cla a, there's a classical description of those solutions. I don't know how much the non-smooth theory is going to add to that. Uh, it, there's some hope that it might add something to a theory where the, you, you have singularities, but they're sort of on a more scattered set, I think, a, more, a less well-defined set where you don't know exactly where they are. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, we'll talk more later. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, let's take... Robert. Yeah. So now there is coffee break. So, so uh, I, can I make an additional remark, sure. actually? So I wanted to make an additional remark. I, I thought it was very, the presentation yesterday morning with the memories of uh, Alessio's time at the School of Normal was very touching. And I think that uh, you are lucky in Italy to have an institution like this. 
um, a public institution, so I don't know of anything similar in the English-speaking world where you have this kind of sense of camaraderie among all the students, and also in the Italian math community, uh, there's somehow, I feel, a sense of family that I am not aware of in the, uh, in the rest of the world. So I think that it's, you, have, you should cherish these institutions that you have. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we can start with the second talk <clears throat> of this morning session uh, with Jose Carrillo de la Plata from <laughs> Imperial College, uh, who is also known to most of us for uh, well his work on uh, analysis, numerics, and modeling of nonlinear PDEs with applications to physical and biological models. Uh, and he will speak today about nonlinear aggregation diffusion equations, reverse HLS inequalities, and equilibration. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, uh, prima di cominciare il mio talk, volevo ringraziare uh, Luigi e Alessio per l'invito qui. Uh, volevo anche dire che um, è stato un piacere essere uno dei tuoi multipli collaboratori. Uh, ma più di questo uh, sai che quelli vincoli di amicizia sono uh, sempre importanti e sono nominati già parecchie volte e fa la differenza nel lavorare con, con te. Uh, ok, so I wanted also to say that uh, the first time I met Alessio was in, I think in uh, Lyon in 2006. I was giving a talk uh, visiting uh, Cedric at that time. But I didn't talk that much about math with him at that point. But uh, the following year, I think in 2007 in Vienna, it was the first, uh, probably was one of the first uh, conferences you attended, probably even. Well, I don't know. But uh, anyhow, so I had that impression. But uh, then we started to talk really in 2008 in the uh, uh, optimal transport uh, um, program in California, and since then we have been discussing many, many, many times. So I couldn't find really a nice picture of the 2008, but I found some picture from 2011, which is, uh, uh, yeah, it was in Santander with uh, several other people here in the audience, but even if this one looks very official, I like better this one, especially because uh, it's not... Uh, uh, always the case that you are between a 2008-18 Fields Medal and 2010 Fields Medal, even if you are not a 2014 Fields Medal. So, so yeah, congratulations, Alessio. So let's come back to uh, business. And um, uh, today I wanted uh, to discuss about uh, uh, nonlinear aggregation diffusion equations. I will. Uh, first introduce quite quickly uh, why I got interested into these particular questions, and then I will concentrate in giving an overview of the different uh, regimes that uh, uh, we believe that there are in these equations. I say we believe it because for some of them we have some results, for some of them we don't, but we have some intuition about them. And then I will concentrate on two, mainly, uh, two main results, uh, one about uh, uh, degenerate uh, cases and the uh, most recent one about uh, fast diffusion cases. Okay, so let me start by posing the general problem related to this. And this is very much related to some of the questions I discussed in the past with, uh, with Alessio, uh, uh, related to uh, the interaction, uh, so system of interacting particles. So most of the models I will discuss today are related to system of interacting particles. So let me introduce the basic uh, brick of the modeling here. So assume that you have n particles that are interacting with a given uh, potential that I'm going to call u. And uh, for me, this uh, interaction potential might be singular, but only at the origin. And if you want to uh, simplify uh, your way of thinking here, assume always that u is radial. It will be the case in uh, most of my talk. And uh, if you uh, uh, consider the interaction between these n particles with uh, damping, and you neglect uh, the inertia term in, in uh, Newton's equation, 
or in, uh, in, uh, in other words, if you assume that the velocity field is given by the sum of forces at each uh, single time, then you can write this kind of first order system for the evolution of the position of the particles. So just that uh, xi dot is gonna give, be given by the sum of forces that every particle j is acting on xi through this uh, potential u, okay? So if you write the uh, density of uh, particles at time t, uh, I mean, kind of uh, the continuum version of this interaction, and you want to write the uh, PD for the evolution of this density of particles, the first uh, thing that you can do is to mimic how you are computing the velocity field. So you say your velocity field now is given by uh, the uh, continuum version of that uh, sum that we have uh, uh, before. So each infinitesimal part of the mass given by the density rho, rho y is producing some force given by gradient u x minus y, and you add all the forces depending on that infinitesimal mass distribution rho. So in that case, you get this integral, which is a convolution of rho with the gradient of the potential u. So if you assume that now you look at the evolution of that density of particles, so you will uh, write a kind of continuity equation for the evolution of the density, where now the velocity field is given by that uh, minus gradient u combo of withdrawal. Good, so what are interesting questions here? Maybe uh, the, f the first thing I want to do and uh, where I will concentrate today is that I will typically separate in that uh, interaction the attractive from the repulsive part, okay? So I will uh, keep uh, locally, uh, I mean non-local in that kind of convolution with the gradient potential, only the attractive part. While the repulsive part, I may consider that is very localized, uh, and there is also a way of looking at that in terms of interaction potentials, or directly, as I am doing here, I'm gonna assume that the repulsive part, in fact, is given by a kind of uh, a local term or a kind of nonlinear diffusion. So that uh, term in blue, gradient of P of rho. Uh, so most of the time today, my interaction potential will be just an attractive field. And the question I want to concentrate is um, if I uh, model the repulsion by this uh, nonlinear diffusion and I have this attraction by uh, this interaction potential, when in general uh, do I have a balance between these attraction and repulsion uh, mechanisms? Okay? So in which sense do I talk about the balance? So uh, in fact, uh, those equations I'm gonna write, they share uh, some common structure that has been already referred in the talk of uh, Macan, uh, I mean, quite collaterally. Uh, and uh, they uh, share the structure of being uh, gradient flows in the sense of uh, the Wasserstein distance, and this is where optimal transport enters and how I started to collaborate with uh, Alessio some years ago. And uh, they share that they have this uh, structure in the sense that, I mean, at this point, I want just to re remind you that they have this uh, natural uh, Lyapunov functional, uh, which is the total potential energy plus the uh, entropy, okay? So, and in that sense, uh, okay, in that sense, we can write uh, the equation as a continuity equation again, where the velocity field is given by the gradient minus the gradient of the uh, variation of this energy. Okay, that's uh, by now is quite standard, as you know, in the theory of uh, gradient flows. So, in which sense I want to talk about uh, this balance between the two mechanisms? I want to clarify under which conditions do we have local or global minimizers or uh, of the total interaction energy. And uh, if I can give uh, conditions on uh, phi and u in such a way that this happen. And what can I say about uh, that when uh, this happens? So this is, of course, a very classical question that in particular cases, it's uh, answer, uh, well, there are plenty of uh, people that have worked in different particular cases. Probably the most classical one is in crystallization and statistical mechanics, uh, where the, uh, the potentials are very singular at the origin, not even locally interval like Leonard Jones. So I'm not talking about those cases. For me, typically, the potentials will be always locally interval, okay? Uh, in fact, in those cases, you cannot talk about uh, uh, the free energy of uh, probability densities because uh, typically you talk about points. Uh, 
The other very classical case is on semiconductors, astrophysics, chemotaxes, uh, in which t uh, the potential uh, is the Poisson equation. And in semiconductors is the repulsive case, which is not an interesting thing today, but in astrophysics or chemotaxis is the uh, uh, attractive case. And I will just comment a little bit on the chemotaxis problem because it's a quite interesting uh, math biology uh, cal, uh, 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 problem. And uh, then there are other applications uh, lately in uh, mean field games. They appear naturally, uh, this kind of question for cournot nash equilibria. Uh, for more singular uh, potentials, uh, you end up with uh, fractional diffusion. There will be another talk about this tomorrow. And uh, uh, for eigenvalue distribution of random matrices, they appear naturally these kind of questions too. Okay, so let me concentrate just a, a, a sec on this uh, chemotaxis model, uh, which uh, uh, somehow is the uh, origin of all, uh, all the uh, many uh, interest, uh, interesting modeling issues in math biology. Uh, the original uh, Keller-Siegel model, as is usually referred, this model in chemotaxis, it was introduced by Keller and Siegel at the beginning of the 70s uh, to model the uh, movement of cells towards uh, regions of high concentration of certain chemical substance to which they are attracted to. So, Let's see if this works. Yeah, it works. So you see that uh, somebody is playing with a pipette and putting the kind of chemoattractant to which these cells are uh, sensible to, and then they direct their movement towards that source of, uh, of the, uh, the chemoattractant. So of course what you want to do is uh, to uh, model this kind of behavior when you have a large number of them. And uh, this is what uh, it was uh, uh, studied by uh, Keller and Siegel in which uh, they assumed that the typical average uh, trajectory of the cells will follow a kind of Brownian motion with a drift, with a drift given by a solution of a reaction diffusion equation here, okay? So in that case, they introduce only the linear uh, um, kind of diffusion. And, um, uh, if you assume that uh, you are in a quasi-static uh, uh, case when uh, you have uh, that the diffusion coefficient for uh, chemoattractant is much larger than uh, for the cell's movement, then you can assume that this is uh, in, the, um, um, in a stationary uh, situation, so you have minus Laplace equals n, and then you can solve this in terms of the neutron and potential inserted here, and you end up exactly in one of the equations that I showed you before. The original uh, problem, as it was uh, studied by Keller Siegel, was in two dimensions. And this uh, um, 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 produced a, a, a large uh, number of, uh, of uh, studies in mathematics studying that particular case because it has a very nice structure, as I will explain uh, later on. Okay. So let me also uh, show some uh, numerical simulation on uh, uh, some other particular case, which uh, showed you uh, some of the complications you may uh, um, uh, face here in order to prove certain things. So this is the case of nonlinear diffusion and using uh, m equals three. And for the attractive potential, I'm just using a Gaussian here, okay? No, not uh, a singular potential. So this is the initial data in taking. And this is uh, now the evolution that uh, uh, you get if you do uh, well, some kind of fundable numerical scheme here. It doesn't, it's not uh, that important. The interesting thing uh, that you check immediately in the behavior is that due to the attraction, you get the concentration. I'm going to just run it again. You get the, con oops, you get the concentration onto these uh, different bumps, in this case, three bumps. But uh, if you look at the time scale here, I mean, it takes uh, uh, quite a lot of time for uh, these uh, bumps to disappear because they see each other anyhow because of the long tail of the Gaussian here. And they are attracting a little bit to each other. And finally, they end up in one single uh, bump. By the way, they are really compactly supported here due to the nonlinear diffusion. So you have this kind of um, behavior in which uh, uh, this is just about um, the um, uh, free, the variation of the free energy. So you can see that the, is, they are uh, time at this time and this is uh, time and snapshot. They are almost steady states because the uh, 
uh, free, the variation of the free energy is almost constant, but in fact they are not, because they, uh, they have a little tilted uh, um, uh, uh, value here in the support that makes them finally the support to get to one single uh, stationary state, completely supported. The question is, can we uh, really prove uh, in some cases that uh, this is what is happening, despite this uh, kind of metastability behavior that you see in the evolution? Uh, of course, this is not uh, something in 1D. You do it in 2D, you get something similar. Uh, this is by an initial data, which is just uh, the characteristic of a square. So you get the concentration to different bumps. These different bumps then get together and get into a single one. Okay. So um, I will come back to uh, this question later. But uh, now let me uh, uh, see if I can make a kind of classification of the different possible behaviors in at least some particular uh, case. So let's uh, concentrate in the homogeneous case. So what do I mean by homogeneous case? I'm gonna assume that both the diffusion and the kernel are homogeneous. So uh, for the density, uh, for the uh, nonlinear diffusion, I take the power m. For the um, uh, uh, potential, I take uh, modulus of x to the k. I will insist in, in, in dividing by k because uh, in this way I forget about the sign of k to say that it's attractive independently of the sign. So obviously this will be uh, the, the, when uh, k is between minus dimension and zero, the uh, corresponding term is gonna be uh, potential energy is gonna be negative. When the uh, k is positive, it's gonna be positive. By the way, here k equals zero for me means just a log and it's just a convention, okay? So just by looking at the scaling considerations between these two terms, you can identify uh, three different regimes. And the scaling consideration is it can be done either at the level of the PD or at the level of the free energy. Because you can see uh, how uh, the free energy changes for dilations of a given density. You take a density row, you just uh, dilate it to keep the mass with the corresponding change of variables with certain parameter, and you see how it changes with that. And uh, you can identify uh, different regimes. The one uh, that we usually call the diffusion-dominated regime is when m is larger than one minus k over dimension. And uh, this corresponds to the fact that when you do this uh, vari uh, variance by the dilation, uh, you have a tendency not to concentrate at zero. So it's not energetically favorable to put the density uh, close to zero, close to a Dirac at the point. Um, this is what uh, we mean by diffusion dominated, okay? Just that the fact that uh, you don't like to concentrate mass at the point. While in the aggregation dominated regime, when m is less than one minus k over d, you have the opposite. And uh, the case in which uh, m is equals to one minus k over dimension is when uh, both terms, they have somehow the same scaling. So, I mean, it's, uh, in some sense, it's a scaling variant. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, both terms, they have the same scale. So, in fact, in some of these uh, cases, there were several results. Um, by the way, the first comment I want to make that is not written on the slides is that obviously the uh, classical keller siegel model corresponds to k equals uh, uh, zero and m equals uh, to one in two dimensions, which obviously lies in the fair competition regime, okay? where the two of them, they scale more or less in the same way. They have a log lambda scaling in that case. So, um, so essentially in the aggregation dominated regime, you would expect that, and it has been proven in certain cases, that uh, you have a, a blow up uh, in the sense of concentration at uh, the origin for uh, solutions independently of the mass of the initial data. While in the diffusion dominated regime, in some particular cases, again, uh, and this goes back to uh, work that I did with uh, Van San Calves in 2006, that uh, if you take, uh, for instance, in two dimensions, I will come back to this later, if you take in two dimensions k equals zero and you put any m larger than one, you immediately uh, avoid the blow up. So you, it's a way of regularizing the Keller cycle. You have, no matter what the mass is, you have global solutions. So uh, let me concentrate now for uh, a few slides on the fair competition regime. And this is where we will see a connection to some um, functional inequalities from the very beginning. Um, okay, 
So if we concentrate in that regime, uh, when M and K are related by this uh, condition, uh, let's uh, concentrate if you want, I mean, for this stem and it doesn't really matter, but let's concentrate first in the case in which they are degenerate. So K between minus dimension and zero will correspond to M between one and two, okay? So as I said, the logarithmic case, when K is equal zero, M equals one, this corresponds exactly to the classical keller siegel in two dimensions, and there have been several works uh, on this. In particular, uh, uh, in the uh, l let me first uh, uh, first uh, make a summary of the situation there, and then I come back to some of the references. So the interesting thing is that there uh, it was discovered by um, uh, Dolvo and Pertam that uh, there is an important functional inequality behind uh, this uh, problem, which is the logarithmic uh, hardy levels of level inequality. And uh, based on that, they were able to characterize the, the uh, critical uh, parameter uh, on the strength of one term to the other that gives you a dichotomy of behavior. So on the critical parameters, if we put chi in front of the uh, chemoattractant, is 8 pi. So this is what, uh, why many people talk about the 8 pi problem for the keller siegel model. So in that case, if you are below the critical parameter, 8 pi in that case, then there are no stationary states and solutions converge uh, to a unique self-similar profile. Solutions are globally, uh, I mean, they exist globally. While if chi is larger than chi c, you can always find initial data and, uh, that uh, blow up in finite time. And for chi equals chi c, is actually the critical. It's the only case in which you have a steady state, but you have infinitely many in that case. And in, in that case, for the keller siegel they are explicit. And in fact, uh, well, the, in, in, in this uh, direction, there was a contribution of Alessio with Eric Carlen, in which uh, they uh, use a quantified version of the log HLS in, uh, in order to estimate uh, some rate of convergence for some of these particular uh, steady states. Okay, so now let me uh, discuss what happens if K uh, is in between minor dimension and zero, which corresponds to the degenerate case, M between one and two. And then I will come back to the fast diffusion case later. So in fact, again, the situation uh, resembles a bit what happens in the um, uh, uh, classical Keller-Siegel model. In this uh, regime, uh, there is a functional inequality that does the job for you, and it's a variation of the, of the harder levels of level inequality. So the variation of the HLS inequality that does the job for you is uh, this one in which uh, you control the potential energy, uh, so this double convolution with the singular kernel, modulus of x to the k, k remembers is negative, by the L1 and LM norm of the function. And this one comes very easily by using the standard HLS uh, in which you use here the same, uh, mean, uh, same uh, LP in, uh, in order to have LP squared to some power, which is this the corresponding uh, number of p that you need to use, and then an interpolation between, because this p is in between uh, one and m in order to get this. So this uh, inequality, you can prove it easily that uh, it comes from HLS, but the interesting thing is that the optimizers of this inequality, they are not the same. So this, uh, the constant that you get uh, from the, uh, using the HLS is not the optimal constant, the constant is smaller. And the interesting thing is that uh, you can show that the optimizers of this are, in fact, company supported, which has nothing to do with what happens with the optimizers of the HLS, which are um, talented type functions. So, um, so again, the interesting thing is that you can characterize this actually the same dichotomy in this whole range of uh, a system of global solutions, um, uh, a system of steady states for the critical value and a blow up for larger than the critical value in terms of the optimal constant of this functional inequality. And uh, precisely the optimal constant of this functional inequality gives you this chi-c in which uh, you have exactly what I said, this kind of dichotomy. Well, um, again, uh, uh, well, I already said it, but uh, let me uh, stress that uh, the uh, optimizers and then the stationary states that you get for the chi equals chi c, they are like 
barren blood type profiles for the porous median equation. They are completely supported, bounded, and regular uh, enough for the singular convolution to make sense. C infinity in their support and certain uh, regularity at the boundary that uh, depends on, the, I mean, some held the regularity at the boundary that depends on the K and the M. Okay, so the interesting thing is also in the fast diffusion case. If you go now to the fast diffusion case, which corresponds to K larger than zero between zero and dimension, and uh, then M, because this relation is gonna be less than one, uh, between zero and one, this is what I mean. Um, okay, sorry. Then the first thing is obvious, the HLS is no longer valid. In fact, the term that you wanted to uh, estimate, they somehow are in the reversed order. And the interesting thing that we were able to prove together with my PhD student, Franca Hoffman and Van San Calvez, is that in fact, there are no stationary states. Uh, no matter what the uh, mass is or the critical parameter chi is, mass and chi are somehow related. So it doesn't really matter we talk about chi as uh, the critical parameter of the mass. But even more, recently, and I will come back to that at the end of my talk, we, uh, uh, we uh, realized that in fact the free energy is not bounded below, even in that case. So in some sense, this relation between M and K, when K, when, uh, sorry, when K is positive or M is uh, less than one, doesn't really characterize the good uh, 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 set of parameters in which you change from one behavior to the other. So it's not really uh, for K uh, uh, positive uh, that is uh, making the difference between what we wanted to call the diffusion nominated case. So it's not really the fair competition case in that, that range. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I don't want to say that much more on this, but uh, I think a, a kind of a, a, a diagram uh, makes uh, the job uh, uh, for me here. Well, I wanted to say that uh, these results that I showed in the fair competition case were done with Franca Hoffman and San Calves. This uh, is a diagram that we did le later in a paper with uh, uh, Franca Hoffman, Mainini, and Bolsone, which are also here in the audience, mm -hmm. in which uh, we studied a bit more in detail the diffusion-dominated uh, regime too. So just to tell you that in the case of degenerate diffusion, if you look at the, this quadrant here, for M larger than one and K negative, <clears throat> uh, certainly in the red line of the parameters, we had this fair competition regime. This is the classical keller siegel model at this point, this point on the diagram. And uh, here we have this uh, HLS inequality that does the job for us to give us the uh, different behaviors. In this regime, in fact, with them, we prove that we have uh, global minimizers of the energy, no, no matter what the mass is. And I will come back to some properties of the diffusion dominated regime here in the, the next point. And uh, as I said, uh, this corner here where uh, K is positive, M is less than one. This division here is not really clear that uh, is given by this red line. I will come back later. I mean, this is not clear and, uh, and in fact, it wasn't clear at that point. We only knew that uh, there were no steady states, but we, we, we didn't know exactly if this was playing a role, okay? And we have understood that quite uh, recently. Well, part of it. Okay, so let me concentrate then on, on these two questions. I'm gonna concentrate a little bit now on the diffusion dominated in the generic case, so this part of the yellow uh, part of this uh, um, left quadrant, and then I will come back to this um, lower part of the quadrant at the end. So, good. So in the, in the degenerate case, if we're in the diffusion dominated regime, when the mass, uh, sorry, when the diffusion is large enough, larger than one minus k over dimension, as I said, in terms of energy, it's uh, more favorable to span the mass to, uh, than to concentrate on a point. So you would expect that uh, you could have, uh, and on top we know, as I mentioned to you, that we have uh, minimizers of the free energy for all values of the masses, so you would expect that uh, the asymptotic behavior are given by this kind of, uh, of, um, of profiles, which is somehow what we saw in the numerical simulations I showed you before, 
uh, with a different potential, but, um, but uh, certainly uh, related to that. So we would expect that uh, they will give you the long time asymptotics of, done, uh, of certain of this equation. So just to set up the question, and, um, and I want to uh, emphasize a particular part of it. So as I said, if uh, we take, for instance, in two dimensions, uh, the classical keller siegel for the interaction, so log interaction, and you put any nonlinear diffusion with n larger than one, we knew that the solution exists globally um, and with uniform bounds in L-infinity. We didn't know what the long, long time asymptotics were. And if you do some simulations consistently, you get the convergence towards a, a completely supported stationary state at the end, even though this kind of metastability behavior in the middle. Uh, but uh, can we really prove that this happens? And um, in this particular case, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, it's one of the uh, cases in which we can show that uh, you have um, um, uh, global minimizers of the free energy, no matter what the mass is. And this is uh, some things that um, uh, we did with uh, Castorina Bolsone some years ago, proving that in that particular case, you have a, a unique global minimizer, which is on top radio, uh, really decreasing, uh, and uh, no matter what the mass is. So this is like the good candidate for being the long term asymptotics. One of the enemies in uh, this business, in order to prove uh, the convergence towards uh, these global minima of the free energy, is this kind of metastability behavior you saw in the simulations. So this metastability behavior that you saw uh, it tells you that, in, in principle, the, uh, the uh, effect of the uh, convection of the attraction is to uh, concentrate uh, the mass into different bumps. But why these bumps, they cannot stay there as a steady, uh, as a steady state? Is there, a contribu uh, is, is there any configuration of uh, some uh, strange way of putting these, even more dimensions, that you could uh, have a steady state with different connected components of the support? That is the thing that was quite complicated to understand if it was possible or not. So in fact, rather than the complication being in terms of the minimization of the energy, it was in terms of, well, I mean, it's related to that. It was in terms of the steady state which were uh, possibly uh, subtle points of the energy. So why I mean uh, this? What uh, the question was uh, related to radial symmetry of steady states. Can you really prove that all your steady states are radially symmetric and that they have only one connected component in the support? That was the difficulty that uh, we had to, uh, uh, to understand in order to get the long time asymptotics. So uh, let me uh, concentrate a few slides on this problem. This is probably where I will give you more details of something, of some proof, which is a quite general result about uh, uh, radial symmetry that uh, we were able to do for this kind of nonlinear aggregation diffusion equations. So I'm going to assume that they have a power law for the nonlinear diffusion, I had attraction given by U. The assumptions on U are that it is really attracting. So, I mean, let me just uh, walk you through the hypothesis. You don't have to read them. I will just uh, tell you where they mean, and uh, you will understand better. The first one means, yes, that the potential is always extremely attractive, okay? So it uh, attracts at every uh, distance. The second one means that the uh, uh, singularity at the origin cannot be worse than the Newtonian. The third one means that, the, and the fourth one means that I want to uh, include all Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian potentials in any dimension. So I want to include the cases in which uh, the potential, uh, the derivative of the potential goes to zero at infinity and cases in which it may increase like the log kernel in two dimensions. So essentially the Newtonian potential is included in any dimension here, okay? And uh, um, that's the origin of those uh, uh, and uh, those assumptions. So let's assume, independently of the fact that uh, maybe I know that in some cases there are no steady states, let's assume that I have a steady state of this equation. 
And I don't need even to be larger than one, although I will, uh, this is where it uh, enters, uh, I mean, where I want to use it more strongly because I want to prove that there is only one single connected component in the support. But even if it applies to uh, cases of fast diffusion. So, but let's keep M larger than one in mind. So let me uh, then state uh, properly the question. Let's assume that we have a stationary state of that problem, meaning an L1, L infinity uh, density, uh, which uh, has, uh, the power M has certain regularity in order to write the equation, the convolution has certain regularity and satisfies the steady state in the, the sense of distribution. If you just use the, the condition of uh, being a stationary states, it's not difficult to prove that uh, uh, what you, uh, you get is that the density will be a continuous function and that uh, in its possibly infinitely many uh, connected components of the support, it has to satisfy this condition, that the variation of the free energy has to be constant in each of the connected components of the support. At the end of the day, what I want to prove is that there is only one connected component, okay? So the, state, the statement that we uh, approve with uh, Sabine Hitmeyer, Bruno Bolson, and Yao is that uh, if you have a stationary state in the above sense, then has to be radially decreasing up to a translation. Okay, so how we uh, got this result, and this is again uh, interesting from the point of view of uh, the variational point of view to this equation, we use uh, strongly the uh, structure of gradient flow in some sense of the equation. We use strongly the fact that we have this uh, uh, energy functional that it has to decay uh, along the uh, solutions of the, of the PDE. But how we use it for the stationary case? So what we do is an argument, uh, an energetical argument by contradiction. Let's assume, and this is where I give you some more details of certain proof, let's assume that we have a stationary solution which is not radially decreasing after any translation. So then this means that I can find at, at I mean, some point in which if I do and some hyperplane, I'm gonna assume it's x1 equals zero, such that if I do reflections around that hyperplane, I don't get the same distribution, okay? What I'm gonna do is to construct for you um, a curve of uh, densities starting for that stationary solution that I'm assuming is assistance, rho s, that I'm gonna call rho epsilon, that depends on some small parameter. And I'm gonna prove for you that, well, I'm gonna tell you, not the proof, this is not gonna be full, but I'm gonna tell you that the energy uh, decays, um, I can uh, decay the energy then by uh, minus constant epsilon, okay? So it decays linearly with this small parameter epsilon with a constant de uh, depending only on rho s and decay. So how we do this? We do this by constructing these, um, uh, small, uh, um, this uh, perturbation of the steady state by what is called continuous Steiner symmetrization. Of course, uh, Steiner symmetrization is an important tool for these uh, problems. This is how you prove, for instance, for the minimization of these problems that the minimas have to be radial. But here we need a bit more in order to uh, attack a stationary state. We need this kind of a continuous Steiner symmetrization. And this gives you an idea of how we construct this perturbation. It's just a um, geometrical intuition. What you do is that uh, you divide your density, let's say mu naught, that you want to construct your new uh, perturbation, and you want to do perturbations that are more radial than the initial uh, function. How you do that? You do a slices on the, on the density, you, uh, you, you find the center of mass of those slices, which are these red points, and then in each of the slides, uh, then you push them either to the left or to the right, this is one dimension, but you can do something similar, uh, reflecting with respect to a hyperplane, you uh, push them to the left or to the right in such a way that you decrease the distance uh, towards the center of mass somehow. So then you get this kind of uh, blue uh, squares where you have moved your slices. In this way, you construct something that is a little bit more radially decreasing than before. Okay? 
So the interesting thing about this uh, continuous Steiner symmetrization is that it does uh, the following job, and this was known to the people working in uh, symmetrization. Uh, it's, it, it keeps the LM norm, but also in the case of the Newtonian potential, it was known that it decreases the interaction. Okay, if you do so. The, all the job that we have uh, done here, which is the most interesting and uh, original part of that, is that we prove, in fact, that uh, with continuous standard symmetrization, the decay of the interaction part is exactly linear with the parameter epsilon. And uh, this is very important for us. Why is it important for us? Because it's, it's going to be the piece of information that we need in order to arrive to certain contradiction. Uh, to, the, to the fact that uh, we have a state state which is not really symmetric. The contradiction comes from the fact that, uh, well, okay, first there is another step that we need to do, which is to massage a bit the continuous Steiner symmetrization in such a way that we have this additional property, which is essentially saying that we don't move the slices at the same uh, velocity, but uh, if you are close to the bottom, to the, to the support, you don't move them at all. So, you have to massage a bit this construction in such a way that we have also this uh, condition. And uh, by doing uh, so, at the end, we can prove that in fact, just by the fact that it's a steady state, satisfies the first order conditions for the uh, functional, then the difference of the energies near the uh, uh, steady state should be epsilon square. And this is the contradiction that you get. Okay, the orders uh, should be, uh, the difference should be of order of silent square while we prove that nearby by, uh, with these uh, competitors, we go below with order of silent. Okay, so that's uh, the, uh, probably the most uh, original part on, that, uh, on this that I wanted to uh, make the emphasis. Then later on, you put this together with m several results that we had to, uh, 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 improve in order to get, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of Newtonian potentials, we get that in fact, at the end of the day, for every single mass, there is a unique stationary state modulo translations uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, which is the global minimizer mass of the energy. Uh, so you need some of the uniqueness result of uh, radial solutions uh, proved by Lip and Yao in the 80s, and then improved by Kim and Yao later on. Uh, together with the, the cases of the log is what we did with the Castorina and Bolsone. Okay, so uh, the interesting thing is that in the diffusion-dominated regime, and coming back to this uh, um, um, scheme of the general relation between the different parameters, in this yellow part of the degenerate case, porous medium regime, we have a unique, for the Newtonian potential at least, we have a unique a stationary state for every given mass as a center of mass, which is completely supported. And uh, it's like a barren like solution in terms of regularity. And it's the right candidate to be the long-time asymptotics. We were able to show that it's the long-time asymptotics in two dimensions, not in three dimensions, because for the evolution problem, we don't know about the confinement of mass. But I will not discuss that. So you see that uh, we were able to catch, at least in those numerical simulations, this final behavior that you always get end up in one single bump. So you have the, the right uh, limit in asymptotic behavior, even if in some of the cases could be that you get there in very, uh, with very, very small uh, rate based on the numerical simulations. We don't know anything theoretically. Okay, so now let me finally... Uh, discuss a little bit of the most recent uh, research uh, uh, that uh, we did on the uh, fast diffusion case. It was uh, certainly not uh, uh, um, very good what we knew in that case, uh, the time of the, what we uh, did in the thesis with Franka Hoffman, in the sense that for that case, I remind you that in that r uh, red line, okay, sorry, it should be here. Uh, the only thing that we said is that uh, there are no steady states. But in fact, now, this, um, this idea that in the HL, uh, what would you wanted to apply some kind of HLS inequality, and you couldn't because uh, the terms were in the reverse uh, direction, was in fact 
the tip of the iceberg there. And uh, this is something that we started to discuss when we were in the Mittal Leffler Institute a couple of years ago with uh, Jan Dolbo. And um, we got uh, certain ideas in how, in that case, we should uh, consider when the diffusion <laughs> dominates somehow in the fast diffusion regime. So that's why, in which sense now diffusion wins, because it's not gonna be in terms of the scaling of the free energy. So let me pose uh, first uh, the theorem in terms of the inequality. So in fact, well, we, 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 uh, we were aware of a certain uh, reverse HLS inequality that was written in a very particular case. Uh, I will come back to that in the next slide. But uh, that uh, we uh, didn't see the connection really with the problem until we uh, somehow understood uh, this, uh, uh, that, that this was a bit more general. Uh, uh, they wrote the reverse HLS inequality in a bit weird way. Anyhow, so what I talk about, uh, what I mean by a reverse HLS inequality, so now your interaction uh, potential energy is uh, positive because the K now is positive. I'm uh, forgetting in this here, divided by K anyhow now is positive. And um, what I want now is to control the LM, I'm gonna I still call, uh, call it LM norm, but I know it is not because M is less than one. But let me just do it like that to keep uh, in mind what we are doing. I want to control the LM norm now with M less than one in terms of the uh, interaction. And in fact, if you look, and, and the mass, if you look at the right scalings, uh, this, you can guess that uh, that should be the kind of inequality you are looking for, okay? So in fact, this inequality is not difficult to prove at the end of the day. It just uses a very easy, uh, um, uh, you just divide in short and in near and far uh, points here in the interval of row M. You do some uh, basic uh, inequality in terms with using moments and uh, you optimize over it, and then you control, and you uh, can re uh, relate the moments with the interaction because you are in the k-positive case, and it goes in the right direction. So anyhow, it's not difficult to prove that this inequality is true, but the interesting thing is that it's true if and only if m is larger than d over d plus k. So below that, you can prove, in fact, that the energy is not bounded below, uh, below uh, m less than that value or even equal to that value. So how it looks like in terms of the parameter space. So this is now the new picture in that region. Um, so this red line that I have here, it's a still the same red line that I had before. So where I know that it's not the right thing to uh, distinguish between behaviors in the uh, fast diffusion range. And now I have this, um, this uh, uh, black line, M equals dimension over dimension plus K. Below that, in region one, the free energy uh, post in L1, LM, LM, you know, again, it's not really what it has to be, it's just a notation, uh, M is less than one, but the post in the free energy there is not bounded below. And even up to the, uh, to the line M equals uh, D, plus, uh, D over D plus K. If you are in region two, Below, below m equals one and above this, in all that region, you can prove that the inequality, the, H, the reverse in HLS inequality holds. And uh, the interesting thing is that we can only show that the minimizer is attained in L1 LM in the dark gray region, okay, for several reasons, above this blue line or above this other red line here. This red curve, which is m equals 2d over d plus k, this corresponds, this curve corresponds exactly to the reverse HLS inequality that was known by Do and Zhou and Engo and Nguyen, in which uh, they take care, uh, they, uh, they prove this uh, reverse HLS inequality in that particular case because in that case the optimizers are uh, explicit and they are also talented type. And they are, is the only case in which we know the optimizers explicitly. Well, there is another case, k equals to two, for which we know, and they are also talented type. But apart from those, in all this dark gray region, uh, we don't know 
uh, the shape of the optimizers, but we know that they are attained in L1 LM. In the rest of the region, in fact, it's a bit smaller. We, know we have a little bit improvement there, but uh, it's not important for the talk. But in this wide region, most of this wide region, we don't know if uh, the minimizer uh, can uh, ascertain L1 LM. In fact, what we did is to uh, give a notion of a more uh, a relaxed free energy, because uh, now uh, the enemy is the fact that the integral row to the m is, is a sublinear, has a sublinear growth at infinity. So you, uh, you, you had to work with the uh, function which have sublinear growth at infinity, and there are plenty of uh, uh, several uh, people here in the audience that know well how to deal uh, with recession functions, especially Giuseppe Butazzo. Uh, so then uh, uh, you had to define a kind of relaxed free energy to work with it. And what we were able to show is that in that kind of relaxed free energy, in all this region two, we can prove that the minimizer is attained and it consists of a radial function plus possibly a Dirac delta at zero with certain mass. That could be zero or not. So I will state the precise statement in the next slide. Finally, zone three is not that much of interest. It's again in the porous medium regime. There, everything that I said before applies, in fact. Uh, you can prove that the minimizers are attained, are completely supported, and everything. So let me uh, explain a bit better what I just said. So we can extend this free energy, and I will not show you the details on this, but just gives you an idea that what we do is just extend it by kind of a gamma convergence kind of uh, argument. Okay, you would just take uh, the right definition in order to make it lower semi-continuous. And uh, then you can prove, in fact, now this uh, function is bounded from below, if and only if, again, m is larger than d over d plus k, but moreover, then there is a global minimizer, which is of the form a density, which is an, uh, I mean, an L1, func um, L1 function plus uh, a possibly a Dirac, uh, zero, a Dirac at zero with a mass that it may be zero or not. And in fact, the only thing that we can say is that if the mass is zero, then this rho star is an optimizer of the reverse HLS inequality. Conversely, also, if we have an optimizer of the reverse HLS inequality, which is in L1 LM, then we have uh, the uh, M star has to be zero. But we don't know if this Dirac is present or not in the whole white area that I have in this figure, okay? So the open problem here is, is that concentration happening or not at the minimization level? Um, we have uh, also some uniqueness uh, result in particular cases, essentially in two regimes. In one regime where displacement uh, convexity plays a role, and in another regime in which the linear uh, kind of convexity plays a role. Okay? But, uh, well, I mean, we have some subset of that gray region for which we know is unique, but we don't know uh, the general answer to that in the whole region too. So essentially, just to summarize, the, 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 the issue that we, uh, we haven't uh, clarified yet here is if this concentration happens or not uh, in that wide region. Uh, um, this will clarify a bit what is the transition between this kind of diffusion dominated in the sense of having a stationary state for uh, any given mass and something else in the fast uh, diffusion regime. We don't understand it yet uh, completely, as you can see. And, uh, but it's quite different, as you see, from uh, respect to porous medium. And uh, the last comment I want to make, in fact, is that um, um, in terms of the evolution problem, for the fast diffusion regime, we don't know anything. Uh, so we haven't uh, even started to uh, think about the, the evolution problem, although it's uh, obviously a very interesting issue. If we see this kind of concentration happening or not. And we expect this reverse HLS inequality to play a big role, of course, in that. But uh, yeah, we don't know yet how to make use of it. Concerning the previous problem in the general diffusion case, so coming back to this, so here, now we know a bit better, we should substitute this by the new uh, uh, diagram that I just showed you. 
concerning the, the, the uh, porous medium regime in that uh, region, we have certain results on the evolution problem, but still uh, having um, uh, uniqueness of the stationary state, uh, regularity of the uh, evolution problem, the solution of the evolution problem, even in the most uh, singular cases, is quite interesting and open, and still uh, people are working heavily on this. Okay, so I think I'm almost over. I just want to conclude and uh, just make a summary of the certain uh, several things I showed you in this kind of overview of these nonlinear aggregation diffusion equations. So I identified several regimes for homogeneous pressure and kernels. In the first competition regime where they scale more or less in the same way for degenerate uh, diffusion, then uh, we have uh, the same dichotomy as for the classical keller siegel case, but this is not the case for the fast diffusion uh, regime. Uh, in the diffusion dominated regime, uh, in the degenerate cases, we always uh, have this convergence towards the stationary states, which are compactly supported and radially decreasing. And uh, there, the symmetry was uh, very important. This symmetry result also applies in the fast diffusion regime. Uh, at, um, so uh, we have uh, a radial symmetry of the stationary states. In the fast diffusion case, uh, we have these reversed HLS inequalities that uh, somehow at least gives you some conditions on the diffusion dominated regime, although they don't clarify it fully since we don't know if the, a sharp condition, if any, if this, I mean, if this uh, concentration phenomenon happens or not, because it may very well be that it doesn't happen and you arrive up to the boundary, but we don't know. Uh, we don't know and we don't have an intuition in one way or another yet. We tried several things, but uh, none is really clear uh, what, uh, what it will give you for the concentration. Anyhow, so my talk is, uh, was a summary of several results with collaborators in, some of, uh, in this list. And uh, the last part was done with Del uh, Matias Delgadino, Jean Dolbo, Rupert Frank, and Franca Hoffman, this part on the fast diffusion and the reverse HLS inequalities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for this nice talk. Uh, let's see if there is any question. OK. Yes. Okay, I didn't understand exactly if there is a relationship between the structure of the stationary states and the fact that you don't know if the concentration happens or not in certain regimes. Yeah, yeah well, well, at the end, one of the, the last of your yeah. point, the open point was the structure, you, you study the stationary state, yes. and then you prove that something happened when along the evolution, you converge to stationary states, and maybe some concentration happened yes, or something. This we don't know. So this is, uh, in fact, as I said, the only thing that we can say about the stationary states, the only thing that we can say is that uh, they consist of uh, maybe a Dirac at zero, and some radial distribution, and as, a, as, a, as such, it's a steady state of the equation. But we cannot rule out if there is a data part or not. And I don't know uh, about the evolution problem either, of course. Ah, okay, so, so there may be it's already in the stationary state. Yes, yeah, so maybe that the stationary state has the Dirac or not, but I don't know. Oh. So in fact, uh, I can rule out the Dirac in all this dark gray region over here. Okay, in the dark gray region, I can rule out the Dirac. So there is only this stationary state with the, which is radially uh, decreasing and uh, in that case uh, supported on the whole space. Okay, so no more questions. Let's, let's thank Jose again. And so this concludes uh, this morning session. Now there is lunch and we'll resume at 3 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, session. Uh, before we start, I have an announcement. So I have some cert attendance uh, certificates ready. So if you need them, just uh, contact me during the meeting. Okay, so now it's a pleasure to introduce Aldo Pratelli from Pisa University. He will be speaking on the Sobol of approximability of planar invertible mappings. So, uh, thank you, Luigi. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, so it was not very easy for me to decide the, the subject of this talk, so I had some ideas, but I thought they were all not interesting enough for the audience, but then in the end I decided that uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, so the things that I can do are maybe not so interesting, but there are a lot of things uh, which I cannot do, which are maybe interesting for you, or if you can solve them for me, I will be happy anyway. Uh, so in this talk I will speak about a fairly general problem, and we will then attack three directions of research. Uh, okay, you see everything. So, what do we want to do? Uh, we want to find the Sobol F approximability for invertible mapping. What does this mean? Basically, uh, we will play only in R2, so our ambient space will be R2, and we have a suitable function which goes from um, omega to delta, they are just two sets in R2, and we want to approximate it. There are several reasons uh, why you want to approximate a function with a better one. And in particular, you want to approximate your function u with a diffeomorphism. So several questions are more or less obvious. So first of all, why should you want to do that? Uh, well, actually, there are, uh, it's not a surprise in the end. So whenever you play with a function, it's always nice if you can approximate this function with a better one, so with a smooth one, so you can do calculations or so. And in particular, I'm interested in uh, applications in nonlinear elasticity. Well, uh, so the questions I'm interested in come from the nonlinear elasticity, where u is a deformation, uh, so not necessarily regular, and you will be happy to approximate u with a more regular deformation. So, for instance, you can uh, use the equation and you can do several things that with a general function you cannot do. So, it will be very nice. Then, second question why is it not obvious? So, we are all used more or less that any function is close to a smooth one. So you can always approximate. Well, the problem is here you want to approximate uh, with an invertible function. So you want to approximate uh, with diffeomorphisms. And in particular, uh, even if your starting function u is uh, injective or a, a bijection, even better, oof, well, the property of being invertible is quite weak. So you can easily lose it. So for instance, uh, you can try to do what you always do, so a convolution. Well, if you do a convolution of a function u, even if u is an homomorphism, so to say, well, the convolution will remain uh, invertible, so it will be a diffeomorphism, only if u is at least w2 infinity. This is a simple calculation, and actually it is physically not that interesting. Usually the deformations are something in w1p. Maybe p can be one or plus infinity, uh, in several cases, but definitely W2P or 2 infinite is not interesting at all. So we cannot do uh, convolution. And okay, we will discuss about this later. So there is not just a function U, also the inverse of U is interesting, but the reason will be clear later, so. Okay, another question, so this is not, uh, this is a question that somebody could like to pose, and so to stop you, I can tell you that nothing is known. So, of course, the physically relevant cases are n equal two and n equal three, and three will be more interesting than two, but nothing is known for dimension three, so don't ask me. Uh, another possible question is, uh, well, maybe somebody could be happy not to approximate with diffeomorphisms, but to approximate uh, with uh, piecewise affine homomorphism. So homomorphism which send uh, in an affine way finitely many triangles in other triangles. Uh, for instance, there are several applications in which um, your, uh, your structure, your object, uh, is uh, a crystalline object, and in, in this case you know that uh, there are several triangles which go affine. Okay, but luckily this is not a problem. 
because approximating with piecewise affine or diffeomorphism is equivalent. So whenever you have one of the two, you have also the other one for free, and then this is the same. Okay, so to conclude the introduction, okay, there are two suitable there at the beginning, so a suitable function, suitable sense, so what do we mean by that? Okay, the suitable sense in which you want to approximate is fairly clear. So depending on the problem you are in, interested in, this is more or less clear. So for instance, if you play with W1P functions, then of course you want to approximate in W1P sense. If you play with functions which are in W1P and was inverse is also in W1P, then you want an approximation in what we call w, uh, BW1P. So you want to approximate at the same time the function and the inverse in W1P. So this is uh, usually obvious from the context. Much less obvious is uh, what are the suitable functions. So it's obvious that you cannot approximate with diffeomorphisms everything. So if you take a sheet of paper and you fold it in two, this is very far from any possible uh, diffeomorphism. So if you take a generic W1P function, even smooth, it's not a problem about smoothness, it's a problem about invertibility. So if you are highly, so to say, non-invertible, then there is no hope to, to be approximable. On the other hand, you could say, well, let me think about just about homomorphisms, so Sobolev because, uh, because of the energy, you have Sobolev functions. You can say you want Sobolev homomorphisms. In this case, uh, well, this is of course, uh, this makes of course interesting the question of approximating, and homomorphism is always something that you can regard as a deformation, maybe with infinite energy, who knows, but anyway, this is something you could like to approximate, uh, but it's a bit restrictive. So there are a lot of interesting deformations which are not homomorphisms. So you cannot be too much non-invertible, uh, but homomorphism is too much. And this is, anyway, a question which is not obvious. So the talk is basically divided in three parts. So we will investigate three things. The first one is, uh, what can you say about the approximation of Sobolev homeomorphisms? So let's think that uh, we have an homomorphism, a Sobolev homomorphism, and we want to approximate it. So let's see how we can play and what we can do. Second part is uh, the suitable. So what are the approximable mappings? which are the maps that you want to approximate. This is uh, uh, non-obvious, but we have some answers, and then uh, we'll think about that. And then part three is uh, the part in which, uh, basically, we do not know anything. So there are some results. I will tell you some results in part three, but uh, uh, highly non-satisfactory. So part three is the open problems, and I would like to spend some minutes to explain you why this is important and why is up to now, everything open. Okay, so this is the plan, and then let's start with Sobolev homomorphisms. So the problem now for the next part is you have your two sets, omega and delta, so it's not a Laplacian, I'm sorry. It's, it's a very bad choice of letter, but since some years we use that and then we don't want to change it. So you have an homomorphism, which is W1P, and you ask yourself if you can approximate it. So whether you find a sequence, uh, UJ, of diffeomorphisms uh, or of piecewise affine homomorphisms, so it's the same, which converge to you strongly in W1P. If possible, you would like to keep the boundary value of U or something like that. Because, of course, if you have something which is uh, an elastic deformation, quite often the boundary value is given or it is something important. So you do not want to lose it completely. So. There are a lot of results to say, and I like to start with some prehistory. So the history of, uh, not of this problem, but of uh, a problem which was interesting several decades ago, which is uh, with one derivative less. So suppose that you don't have W1P homomorphisms, but just homomorphisms. So continuous functions which are invertible and with continuous inverse. So, no Sobolev at all, and you want a uniform approximation. So, can you approximate uh, homomorphisms uh, with, uh, with diffeomorphisms uh, in L-infinity? Okay, this was extremely important for some time uh, in geometric topology and graph theory. I didn't really well understand why, but anyway, there are a lot of papers, and it's funny because if you look at the bibliography, all these papers uh, 
almost all these papers uh, appeared on Annals of Mathematics, so it means it was important for them. Uh, so in 2019-25, Radot proved that uh, in case, in the planar case, uh, n equal to, then it's true. So if you have an homomorphism, you can approximate it with uh, uh, smooth diffeomorphism uniformly. And then the same thing after 30 years, uh, Moise and Bing uh, in the 50s uh, proved the same thing for dimension three, and then for dimension at least five, uh, there was a lot of papers by Connell, Bing, uh, Kirby, Sieben, Manval, uh, Rushing, Lukainen, and also other people. There, there was a, a bunch of papers in those years, uh, and they proved more or less the same thing for dimension at least five, uh, and because of some exotic structure, topological structures of dimension four, uh, uh, the very same result is not true in dimension four, uh, and incredibly enough, at least for me, it becomes again true for, from dimension five on. Uh, and this is uh, the, it follows from a construction by Donaldson and Sullivan in 89. So this is more or less everything you need to know if you don't want to have derivatives. So in the uh, just L infinity approximation of maps, this is everything. But then, okay, if you are interested in uh, nonlinear elasticity, you have an energy which goes with the derivative and so you want some of things. So the prehistory is gone. Let's talk about the history, which is fairly recent. Since the beginning of the 80s, uh, Evans and Ball said, uh, well, we should solve this problem, but a lot of time passed before there were some partial uh, answers. And so recall that what you want is to approximate in W1P with diffeomorphisms a W1P homeomorphism. Okay, the first answer, okay, it might seem uh, ridiculous, but it was a very deep result. So Mora Corral, which was a student of John Ball, in 2009 said, yes, you can approximate if your function is already smooth uh, outside a point or outside a finite set. So a point of, or a finite set is the same, but even proving that you can approximate uh, with diffeomorphism a function which is uh, basically already diffeomorphism, so a smooth function, a smooth homomorphism except at a point, uh, it already required a lot of work. And then um, one year after, uh, with uh, Jose Bellido, Mora Corral proved the same with more structure. So if U is Holder continuous, then you can approximate in the Holder continuous sense with some loss. So if you, have, if you have C0 alpha, then you can approximate in C0 beta for some beta smaller than alpha. And after these preliminary results, then finally uh, there were several papers by Ivanish, Kovalev, and Oninen. The most important ones are those in which they prove that the answer is yes if p equal to. So if p equals to, then you can do the job. So you can approximate it. And then they prove that the same is true for any p between one and infinity. Okay, journals are funny. So of course the paper with p equal to came before the paper with all p bigger than one, but it appeared one year after. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the second paper proved uh, for every p strictly bigger than one that uh, you can do the same. And then last year, so actually three years ago, but then last year it appeared with Stanislav Ankel, we proved that uh, the same result is true uh, with p equals to one. And actually the, the most important part of this proof is not just uh, to reach the case p equal one, which was left open, but also to give a completely different structure of proof because this is a structure which can be used uh, for other results, as we will see. And uh, just a few months later, using the very same <clears throat> structure of proof, uh, Daniel Campbell and Manuel Radici proved that the same construction can be done for any p bigger than one, not just for p equal one. And also you can do the very same with uh, orritz sobolev norms. So L p log p, uh, or things like that. Uh, okay, the boundary datum, I told you, you would like uh, to keep the boundary value. This is not a problem. So in this kind of, uh, of problems, boundary datum is luckily not an issue. So. Not also, the important thing will be, for the applications at least, that the image of U is the wall delta. So the same as the image of any UJ, but in the end, actually, whenever you have a boundary datum, you keep the same boundary datum. So the difference is in W1P0, if this makes sense, and if omega is unbounded, for instance, or if you don't have a boundary datum, you can approximate as good as you want. So 
whatever sense you want to give to the approximation in the boundary is true. So this is luckily not a problem. Okay, how, very, very quickly, how did the proof work? So in the many papers by Ivan Eskovalev and Nonninen or different pairs of these three, uh, they have a very powerful method where they use uh, basically p-harmonic extensions. And we will see later why you need to make extensions. And then they, well, basically they start saying R2 is the complex plane, and in the complex plane, uh, you can use a lot of extension results, uh, and they work. We will see in the next slide why this makes sense. Okay, let me briefly, but not too briefly, say something about uh, the construction in our papers. So there are a few steps. So in our paper and in several other papers, uh, which use the same, idea. So first you start by taking your set, uh, your, your domain omega, and you divide it in several squares or triangles, but squares are nicer to, to play with. And you would like to play separately in every square. And uh, you can choose the squares so that the integral of du, the boundary integral of du in any square controls up to a constant the integral inside. So the mean average of the u on the boundary must control the mean average in the whole square. This is not that difficult. Uh, then you modify your function uh, u to remain, uh, yeah? Sorry? Yeah, so you want that uh, uh, the u is, so if you have a square in which the u is nice, uh, maybe you have that in the boundary, the u makes something crazy. If this happens, you will not take that square. You move a little bit the square so that the integral in the boundary is smaller, so controls from below the integral inside. If this happens, uh, you forget about what you did inside and you just remember the boundary datum. That's the idea. And then you change the boundary datum a little bit just to make it piecewise linear. This is a technical thing and it is not a problem. Since your function is continuous, uh, you just have to make it piecewise linear, remaining injective. That's also not a big problem. And then, uh, as I said, you forget what you did in, inside every square. You just keep memory of the boundary datum and in each square you need an extension. So for instance, uh, this is not that far from what Ivan H. Koval and Venonine did. Uh, for them, uh, inside every square, they wanted to use the p-harmonic extension, for instance, uh, which was, by definition, smooth, uh, and the problem was to put together the boundaries. So they had the function for free, which was smooth in every square, uh, and then the problem is to remain smooth when you pass from a square to the other. Uh, what we did was different, but in, a way, in any way, you want to make an, in, an extension inside. So how do we want to make uh, an extension? very quickly. You divide your squares into groups, the bad squares and the good squares. Good means your function is, very is already very close to be affine, and bad squares are the others. The point is, of course, near any point, which is a back point for the derivative, if you take a very small square, then you are actually close to an affine function. And then, if you take very small squares, the back points are almost everywhere, so the majority of your set is done by good squares. So the bad area is as small as you wish. And then how do you do the extension? Well, there are two groups. So for the bad squares, it is not a problem. They are so little, so there are so few bad squares that uh, as soon as you do an extension, you are happy. So there is a result which tells you that whenever you have a boundary datum, you can make an extension inside and the integral of du to the power p inside is controlled by the boundary datum. And actually, the boundary datum was controlled by the old du inside. And so the integral of your extension, v, which is smooth, is controlled by a constant times the original energy. And since uh, the bad region is small, uh, the integral of the difference to the power p is as small as you wish. Triangular inequality, not a problem. So the fact that you have an extension with a constant k, which is not that good, but who cares? Since they are the bad squares, you can do this and it's already okay. What do you do in the good squares? So it's very intuitive that good squares are good. Indeed, your map is very close to be affine and you could think, well, we did think, if you are really close to be affine, it will not be a problem to become affine. 
up to adjusting a little bit. And indeed, the disease, uh, it is not obvious, but it's fairly easy. Uh, because basically, since you are close to BF fine, the image of your small square is very close to be some parallelogram, and then you do your job. The problem is only if the parallelogram degenerates. Nobody prevents uh, DU to have uh, zero determinant, for instance, and in that case, uh, well, very close to a parallelogram is something. Very close to a segment is much more difficult. And then actually, uh, to make an extension in that case is the most complicated part, but you can do that, and then the paper works. So that's the end of the story for part one. OK, so you know how to approximate homeomorphisms in W1P, but then you, you go back to the original question, so one of the original questions of the beginning. So which functions do you want to approximate? Well, the idea is uh, uh, you want to approximate all the functions which are meaningful. So all the functions which can be reasonable deformations are functions that you want to approximate. So all the functions are too many. So a function which is completely far from being uh, injective is something you cannot approximate and that you do not want to approximate, so who cares? Homeomorphisms, uh, well, now you know everything about homomorphisms. You can approximate them, but you are missing something. And in particular, uh, you are missing cavitations. A cavitation is... Uh, when you take a disk and you explode everything on the boundary. So something, at least locally, something uh, of the form x which goes into x over modulus of x. So you take a small disk and everything goes on the boundary radially. This is not continuous. You lose also the surjectivity because you will never enter inside. But this is something which has uh, finite energy, which is a reasonable deformation, and then you want to consider that. And a function doing something like that uh, is uh, non-injective and non-surjective. So there are lines which go all in the same point, uh, so non-injective, and there is the image of the disk, which is, so the interior of the disk is never taken, so it is also non-surjective. And whenever p is smaller than two, you can do that, so the function x over modulus of x is in W1p for p smaller than two, and then uh, you want to be able to do that because it's a reasonable deformation. On the other side, uh, instead of exploding a disk on the boundary, you can do the opposite. You take a disk and you shrink all the disk into a point. This is, of course, the limit of shrinking to a ball of radius epsilon when epsilon goes to zero. So this is a reasonable deformation, and again, you are losing uh, injectivity. So these are uh, two typical things that can happen for p smaller than two, and you want to play with them. So uh, the idea is uh, quite vague. You want to approximate every reasonable deformation, and uh, well, you can think about the deformation how you wish. I can borrow you my vision of a, def of a deformation. So a deformation is something which is usually a nice thing, and then you have some cavitations and some shrinking. So think about something which is smooth, if you want, but then sometimes you have a cavitation, so a disk which explodes on the boundary, and in other places you have disks which come to a point. This is a good uh, list of deformations. Of course, they don't have to be disks, but it's easier to imagine. So these are objects that you want to approximate. And you want to approximate every reasonable deformation, which makes no sense because we have to discuss what is a reasonable, reasonable deformation. And in the end, uh, you realize that uh, the question is ill-posed. So the question should be on the other way around. A reasonable deformation is something that you can approximate. And if you think a few seconds about that, it is more or less a tautology. So if you have something which is limit of diffeomorphisms, of course you must accept the idea that this is a reasonable deformation. And on the other way, on the other hand, if something is, some, is very far from any smooth deformation, you cannot think about that as a possible deformation. And so the question is no more whether you can approximate uh, uh, reasonable deformations, because reasonable deformations are approximable by definition. So the question is, uh, can you give a description of these maps? So you want to accept all the limits. We can discuss if you prefer weak or strong limits. But anyway, you want to accept all the limits of, uh, of the W1P limits of diffeomorphisms, and then they are approximable, clear. But the point is, who are they? The definition closure of uh, is perfectly rigorous, but it doesn't tell you anything special. So you want to understand what they are. 
Uh, okay, from if you want, uh, you can just think that you send the square into the square with identity on the boundary. It doesn't really change anything because I said boundary datum uh, is not really a problem. So if you want to think about uh, square which goes to a square with identity on the boundary and you do something inside, some deformation. So what are the previous results? There are a lot of results also in this setting. And again, the first results were without Sobolev structure. So Young, in a series of papers between 44 and 48, proved that, again, there are no derivatives. You make uniform limits of homeomorphisms, and he proved that they are exactly the monotone mappings. So what is a monotone mapping? It, a map is said monotone, so a continuous map is said monotone if whenever you take a point, the counter image is connected. So if you are an homomorphism, the counter image of every point is a point. But think about our model of the formation. If you have, well, you can tell this in several ways, but for instance, if you have a disk which collapses into a point, the counter image of the point is a full disk. So something which is not a point, but which is connected. And if you do a cavitation, again, so with limit of homeomorphisms, you can easily do things for which counter image of points are connected. But it's not difficult to realize that you can never do something for which the counter image of a point is disconnected. There is a very simple topological reason which prevents you to do so. Young proved also the other implication. So in dimension two, you can approximate uniformly a map with homeomorphisms if and only if you are monotone. OK, this is a good thing. And the nice thing is that uh, this statement generalizes perfectly to the Sobolev case. And this was done again by Ivana Chandoninen in uh, a couple of papers in 2016 and 17. They proved, so take a continuous map in W1P. Again, uh, so with their strategy, uh, they always have P strictly bigger than one uh, because the P harmonic extension does not exist. So all the estimates explode when P goes to one. So that's the reason. So they say, if you take any continuous W1P map, uh, if it is monotone, then it is a limit of diffeomorphisms. And actually, for P bigger than two, it is an if and only if. So for P bigger or equal than two, uh, you have a map which is continuous. So if you, have, uh, if you have a good structure, even W1, two functions are continuous. Uh, so limits of diffeomorphisms for P equal two are continuous, even if in general w one, two function in dimension two is not. So they prove that for P bigger or equal than two, this is a characterization. So a map, so the closure of the femorphisms are exactly the continuous monotone maps. And the nice thing is that this holds both for the weak and strong closure. So it doesn't matter if you prefer the weak or the strong, it is the same, which is particularly nice because uh, these functions uh, are a subset of W1P which is completely crazy, it has nothing like convexity. Nevertheless, the strong and weak closure are the same. And so if you want to play with continuous functions, then continuous functions are limit of W1P diffeomorphisms, if and only if they are monotone. Okay, the point is you want to play with P smaller than two and with non-continuous maps, because you want to give an answer in the case of cavitations or shrinkings. Uh, and in this case, uh, even the definition of monotone makes no sense. Because the definition of monotone, which is still there, uh, makes sense if you play with uh, continuous mappings, because you need uh, a precise uh, pointwise definition. If you start saying up to zero measure, well, up to zero measure, every set can be connected or disconnected. So you can always connect different pieces with zero measure, or if you take something connected with a one-dimensional hole, it is no more connected. So the very definition makes not really sense for non-continuous mappings. Okay, so we want to give an answer in general, and we understand that the definition of monotone makes not really sense. And we have already uh, some help from the from the past, which are the inv mappings. The inv mappings were defined by Müller and Spector in 1995, and uh, they were precisely defined to play with uh, cavitations. So the famous paper by Müller and Spector uh, is titled, uh, don't remember, but it's something like a model which allows for cavitations. 
it's a bit longer the title, the title, but so in the title they speak about uh, cavitations and they define inv mappings. So inv is short for invertible, of course. So these are mappings which are not invertible, but which would like to. So take a function u, suppose that it is a Sobolev function because you are interested in a Sobolev function, and consider a circle. So I wrote it in general, so a closed path, a continuous injective closed path, so think about the circle, it's easier to think, on which u is defined. If u is a Sobolev function, it's not defined everywhere, but for almost every circle, u is continuous there. So if you neglect the circles which contain non-continuity point for u, you have, generically speaking, a continuous map defined on the circle. And so you say that your function is inv if uh, whenever you take a point, so almost every point, inside the circle as an image which goes inside the image u of gamma, and almost every point which is outside remains outside. So inv means what is inside remains inside, and what is outside remains outside. Uh, we just have to discuss what does inside and outside mean. So inside or outside the circle is obvious. But u of gamma is not necessarily injective. If u of gamma is a continuous injective function, then you know what is inside and what is outside. But it can also uh, collapse or be highly non-injective. And so by inside or outside, we mean, so Mullen Spector mean degree zero or degree non-zero. So you want that all the points in outside the circle for which u is defined, they go somewhere where the degree of, uh, with respect to u of gamma is zero. And the points which are inside go where the degree is not zero. And actually, you can prove that if you are the identity on the boundary, the only way for the degree to be non-zero is to be one, as you imagine. But anyway, so this is a, a very powerful definition. It's quite simple, so you can think uh, of an inv map uh, as a map which uh, keeps the inside and the outside. So you don't want to reverse. If you do reverse, then you cannot be a deformation which is identity on the boundary. That's the idea. Actually, for continuous mappings, where you have the definition of monotone, you prove, not very difficultly, that inv or monotone is the very same. So for continuous mappings, this inv is a complicated way to, define, to redefine the monotonicity. OK, which is good. Another good thing is that this inf property is, so Müller Spector proved that this inf property is closed under weak limits. So it is a necessary condition. Of course, a diffeomorphism has the inf property. That's needless to say. And then a limit, even a weak limit of diffeomorphism, of diffeomorphisms must be inv. Actually, the good thing, I will not spend time on that, but uh, it's important that you know this point. Whenever you have a W1P function, you can always define it precisely and pointwise as a multifunction. I'm not speaking about the representative, some special representative or so. You take your function and you, you say exactly how much, so what is the function at every point as a multifunction. The definition is rather technical, but it's not that important. The important is keep in mind your, uh, our example. If you have a deformation which is something smooth everywhere and then it has some cavitations and some points which are shrinking, well, the idea is wherever you are smooth, your image is your image, nothing to say. If you have some disk which collapses to a point, well, any point of the disk has as image the point itself. And if you have a cavitation, well, what happens? For a cavitation, the function is actually defined everywhere except in the, in the center. Well, the image of the center in this sense, is defined as the wall disk. So basically, all the small circles continue to have the, the smaller and smaller at the circle. The image is always the big circle of radius one up to radius zero. The point, the center, has as image the wall disk. And then, well, in all the examples, is pretty clear what u as a multifunction is. OK, once you define u pointwise as a multifunction, then you can say what is u minus 1 of a point. So u minus 1 of a point are all the points for which u either equals that point or at least contains that point. And then 
For instance, uh, Barchesi, Henao, and Mora Corral, uh, in a paper of a couple of years ago, they proved, so they proved a lot of things. Uh, and in particular, a corollary of one of their results, uh, which they didn't even notice because it was not interesting for them, but it's interesting for us, uh, is that uh, for a function which is non-continuous, uh, inv is the same as uh, country image of points is connected. You can prove, so now that you have the precise definition of u, you have also the country image of points, and you can still say that you want a country image to be connected. Well, that the country image of a point is connected is exactly the same as inv, as few lines above. You do not use the word monotone for functions which are not continuous, but you can still say country image of points connected, and it's still the same. So, well, it's not very difficult to make a conjecture, so the more or less obvious conjecture is that uh, the set you are looking for, uh, so the closure of diffeomorphisms must be the inv mappings. For a long time, we were sure that this was the answer, but it is not in the end. Okay, so let me now introduce uh, the, the real answer, which are the non-crossing mappings. So take your function u from the square to the square, uh, suppose that it is a Sobole function, and take a grid. Don't don't think about anything complicated. You can think that your gamma are finitely many vertical plus finitely many horizontal segments. That's what you really use. As said above, your function is Sobolev, so it is not continuous, but for almost every line, it is continuous there. So not for all the grids, but for almost all the grids, if you take these segments, horizontal and vertical, there your function is continuous. And so you can precisely say what is the image, not as a multifunction, as a pointwise defined continuous function, and so on. Now, forget everything. Remember just how much is u on gamma. So keep just track of what is u on gamma. And you ask yourself now if you can extend this restriction to the wall square, remaining injective. And you want to remain uniformly close to u in gamma, because you, now we have forgot all your function, all your regional function u, except its value on gamma. If the function u on gamma is injective, you have nothing to do. You approximate it with itself. Well, you ask yourself if you can make u injective on your grid. If this happens, then, and this happens for any choice of gamma, then you say that the map is non-crossing. The reason of the name is uh, uh, very simple. So if you are an homomorphism, then u on gamma is already injective. So it is not a problem. You can make a lot of things which are reasonable and interesting and important which are non-injective. For instance, you make a loop and you go away. Well, if you do something nice, you do a loop, a closed one, and you go away, of course you can open the double point. It is not a problem. And you can do this very close as you wish in the uniform sense. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, you don't, it's, it's wrong there. You do not want to make an extension in the square. You want to make, uh, to change your function on gamma. So you forget everything which is not gamma. You take gamma, on gamma you have a function u, and you want to change u so that in gamma it becomes injective. So it's clear that even if u is not injective, you can do so sometimes, for instance, for the closed loop. But if you have a real, non, a real crossing, you cannot. So if you do a loop and you make an x somewhere, uniformly close to an x, you will never open this up. So no way. So if you, make, if you cross yourself, you cannot be injective. If you just do a loop, then you can. So this is the reason why you say non-crossing. Also, this property is closed under weak limits, so a diffeomorphism is non-crossing, of course. Any homeomorphism is non-crossing, by definition, because the map is already injective without uh, uniform approximation. So it is necessary to have this property. And there are some counterexamples which show that this property is actually strictly stronger than the inv property. So you can, be, uh, you can have the inv property without being non-crossing. And so inv is not the answer because this non-crossing is necessary. And actually, well, in, in functions are known to be not so good uh, without the assumption that the determinant of du is positive almost everywhere. But actually, this is a very reasonable physical assumption. So in, in Mueller and Spector, but in many papers which use the inv 
assumption, basically that the U is bigger than zero almost everywhere because otherwise you have infinite energy and so who cares. But even with this extra assumption, you still have uh, inv maps which are not non-crossing. And so the, a paper with Guido de Filippis of last year says uh, that actually the W1P closure and again both weak and strong of the different morphisms are exactly the non-crossing mappings. And this holds for every P bigger or equal uh, to one. I will not spend time on this. I just want to say that uh, the big difference in a sense between the inv property, which is a great property, but not the right one for this question, and the non-crossing is that uh, if you have a function u and you have to check whether u is inv or not, uh, you have to perform a static check. So you take a picture of the image of u on your <coughs> curve, and then you see if the inside remains inside and the outside goes outside. Instead, if you want to check that uh, <coughs> your function is an in function, you have to follow uh, u, because you don't ask uh, what is the image of u on gamma the, as a set. You ask it is as a function. So if I have to draw the image of u on a curve, inv does not watch my hand. It waits until I made the picture and it looks the picture. Instead, if you want to check inv, you stay there and you check how do I do the things. And this is a, an important difference, because uh, suppose that uh, I do a segment, then I do a loop, and I go away, then both inv and non-crossing are happy because there is this point, but you can open this up, no problem. Now, if I do a segment, and then I make one loop, and then another loop, and then I go away, it, there is no difference. You can open both loops, who cares? So you make this open thing, which is injective. So again, both inv and non-crossing are the same. But what happens if I do the segment, I do my two loops, but first I do this loop, and then I go back? this is not non-crossing. Because you go, you make a loop here, I need something bigger, so I make a loop here on your left, then you go on your right, and you have to cross yourself. Nobody cares how you want to open these things up. You are crossing yourself, and there is no solution for that. Now, if you look at the picture, you just say a segment with two loops. You have no idea which one you did before and which one you did after. And so, you say, well, why not? This might be possible. And actually, this is possible if you do first the right loop and then the left loop, and it is impossible if you do first the left and then the right. That's the reason why Inv does not notice that this is uh, impossible. Or depending on how you do the things, it might be possible or impossible. Inv does not see the difference, and non-crossing uh, stays there and watch you and checks everything and tells you this is possible, this is impossible. So this is the reason why it is stronger assumption, more precise, and it is the, the real answer. OK, a very quick conclusion of part two. Don't hope to escape. Uh, so in the continuous case, a very simple exercise shows that actually counter image of points connected is the same as, uh, so CCND is not a definition, it's just shorter for a connected set, a closed connected set which does not disconnect. Does not disconnect means the complement is connected. So a circle is closed and connected, but it disconnects in inside and outside. A wall disk does not disconnect. So a point is, of course, closed, connected, and not disconnecting. That's clear, so. But in the continuous case, point or CCND is the same. So you are monotone, so counter image of points is connected. If and only if counter image of this connected, closed, and not, not disconnected set is still CCND. It's Pretty simple to show that it's the same. In the, uh, and the f if you're in the non-continuous case, uh, the first thing, so country image of points connected, is equivalent to the inv property. But, ah, I didn't write that, okay. These two things are highly non-equivalent in the non-continuous case. So in the continuous case, they are trivially equivalent. In the non-continuous case, there is a huge difference between the first one, which is inv in the end, and the second one, which is uh, country image of CCND is CCND. And then, again with the Philippis, uh, we prove that uh, uh, the fact that country image of points is connected, so the monotonicity, so to say, is, so the inv property is not sufficient. You need a stronger assumption. But on the other way, on the other hand, the second assumption, so country image of CCND is CCND, is enough. It is even too much. So it is not an if and only if. It is sufficient, but not necessary. So I have these two results. 
One result tells you that uh, approximable mappings are exactly the non-crossing ones. And this second result says, uh, well, if you want to play with counter images, uh, then uh, the fact that counter, image of, counter images of CCND are CCND is not necessary but sufficient. Which, well, actually this theorem is much harder than the other one. And uh, well, they can both be meaningful and interesting in the sense that uh, they go in the opposite directions in the sense that uh, as well as inv, non-crossing is a property which looks at the image of you and tells you if you are uh, inv or uh, non-crossing or whatever you want. With counter image, you do the opposite. You don't watch the function u, you watch the function u minus one. So depending on the applications, it might be, so in some cases it is easier to check, to check whether you are non-crossing or inv. In other cases, it's simpler to check the counter images and not the images. But anyway, you have both things, so you choose the one you prefer. And actually, at the beginning, we hoped uh, that instead of playing with grids, uh, it would have been enough to play with a curve, but it is not enough, so you really have to approximate to, to injectify grids and not single segments. If you can approximate single segments, this is uh, not enough. Okay, now the third part, there is, uh, this will be shorter because basically I have to say nothing special is known, but I want to speak a little bit about that. So the problem now is the same as in the first part, but with the inverse. So you have a function u which is, uh, let's say that it is an homomorphism, so forget part two. Now in part one and three we play with homomorphisms, you have a BW on homomorphism, and you want to approximate it with a sequence of different morphisms in BW on P. So the, the sequence UJ must converge to U, and the sequence UJ minus one at the same time must converge to U minus one. Okay, why is this, so I, I still words from Giuseppe Buttazzo, so why is this the true problem in this setting? Well, actually, uh, all the problem uh, without the inverse uh, was a toy model. It, needed 35 years to be solved, but in the end it is not interesting because your deformation is minimizing some energy. There are plenty of examples of different functionals. Uh, I'm not interested in any specific functionals, but all the, function, all the functionals uh, which you have to minimize to be a deformation are something where you have two parts. Uh, a part which is uh, the integral of du to the power p or some function of du to the power p, and then the integral of some function of that du. And this function of the TU always explodes uh, when the argument goes to zero. And this is basically, this says that if you want to compress a lot, uh, you have to pay for that. If you have an incompressible uh, elastic structure, then the determinant of the U is one by definition. If you are elastic, then you are also compressible, but you can compress a little bit. If you want really to compress a lot the set, uh, you have to push with a lot of strength and then H explodes when the determinant goes to zero. And then if you approximate only on one side, uh, you are very happy for uh, the first integral, but with the second integral, you are doing a disaster. And that's also the reason why I said before that in the physically relevant uh, applications, you do know that the determinant of du is non zero almost everywhere because otherwise your energy is infinite. And then you want to approximate uh, not just u, but also u minus one, because then if you approximate both uh, and the function h has a p growth in zero and in infinity, then you are actually making an approximation which is good for the functional because you are interested in the energy, not in the Sobolev norms. And then you want to approximate in the energy. Well, if you approximate in W1P, it's not interesting. If you approximate in BW1P, then you are approximating in the energy, which is the, the thing you have to do. Okay, so this is the problem you would like to know, but so there are just three cases which are known but they are all uh, not that nice, let me say that. So uh, the first of the three is a paper with uh, Daneri in 2000, sorry, two papers of 2014-15, which says, uh, yes, you can do. You can approximate with every p between one and infinity, but provided that your function is not just BW1p, but uh, B Lipschitz. So if your function is uh, B Lipschitz, then you can do the approximation in your favorite W1p. Uh, this is not very satisfactory. So it was a very hard proof. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, but still, this is not uh, what you really want because, uh, well, actually, there are some applications in which you know a priori that uh, U is B Lipschitz because of some uh, physical obstruction which prevents you from having too big the U. 
In this case, it's actually this uh, is the approximation you want. So you want to approximate in the energy, so in W1P, in BW1P, but you are a priori beliefs, it's uh, perfect. So for this case, uh, the result is enough, but the problem is that uh, beliefs is such a strong assumption that uh, this paper does not, uh, so the, the proof of this paper is not something you can use for other cases. So it's a pity. Another paper of 2017, I proved, uh, yes, you can do the very full result for P equal to one, but say, okay, I can say that because I was the author, this is not that nice result. It is uh, not completely trivial, but very easy. And the funny thing is that, so while in a sense P equal one is the most difficult case, if you want to make the approximation, uh, I don't, I cannot go into the detail, but actually for the approximation, if you can do P equal one, you can do all the P's because all the difficulties goes inside the P equal one case. Well, for the inverse, uh, P equal one is not the simplest, is the trivial one and all the others have nothing to do. And the reason is that, um, very simply, in dimension two, the integral of a function du, which is BW11, the integral of du in any set is equal to the integral of du minus one in the image. And then basically, if you're approximating in W11, you are already almost perfectly approximating in the inverse. So the case P equal one, I'm not that proud of that. So it is uh, almost trivial. So the third known case is going so to say, in the wrong direction. Instead of going from W11 to W1P, you go backward, you play with the BBV case, which is uh, an interesting case. So together with uh, Emanuele Radici, we proved that if your function is B, BV, so you are BV and your inverse is also BV, which is a case which has been studied a lot uh, in, uh, by Ansel and also by Napolitan guys, Bordone, Schiattarella, and several other people. Well, in this case, you can have a sequence which is converging in the area strict sense. So usually in BV, you have, three, uh, you have two possible weak senses. The weak, or weak star if you prefer convergence, and the strict one. So the area strict is a bit stronger. It's the strongest thing you can do with a weak convergence. So a sequence UJ, area strict converges to you, quickly said if, okay, uj must converge to u in L1, as always. And then uh, strict will mean that uh, duj converges to du strictly. That is, it converges weakly and the norm converges to the norm. Well, actually, just a part of duj converges to the singular part of du strictly. And the other part of duj, instead of converging, of converging strictly, converges strongly in L1. So this is the best you can do. So you have smooth maps. Of course, with smooth maps, you cannot approximate strongly a singular measure, but you can approximate strongly L1. So this is the best you can hope. Your functions uj are converging, okay, strongly in L1, but that's always true. And your duj is, uh, so a piece is converging strongly in L1 to nabla u, so to, to the absolutely continuous part, and the singular part is uh, just a strict limit, uh, better than that it cannot be. So this is a sharp result for the BV case. Uh, again, very happy about that, but I would like to go in the BW1P because this is the real problem we want to solve. And so in the last five minutes, I can make you a list of things that I don't know. So basically all the things, uh, so ask me whatever you want, and my answer is I cannot do that. Even the simplest questions, that's a bit a pity. So I'm happy if any help comes. So for the BW1P case, so take all the construction for the Sobolev case. There are several points. Some of them are trivial things, some are simple, and some are the hard steps. Well, even the, not the simple, even the trivial ones for the Sobolev case are, at least to me, completely unknown for the Bisobolev. I tried with some of the experts in the years, but nothing happened. And uh, well, we heard in last days that uh, the strategy of Alessio when he cannot do a problem is uh, he does two things. First, uh, he goes on trying uh, and then he solves the problem. I am proud to say I am half as good as Alessio. So the first thing I do, I continue to go on, but I don't solve anything, at least up to now. But it's nice to try. So the point is, uh, why is B Sobolev so completely crazy with respect to Sobolev. The point is when you make an extension, you have to do extensions in the end. That's 
The important part is to do extensions. Whenever you do extensions, uh, you naturally have very small determinant in some places. So du is very close to zero, or at least the determinant of du is very close to zero in some zones. You do not care. So if du equals to zero, or is very close to zero for the Sobolev norm is not a problem. On the contrary, it's a good thing. Uh, well, the inverse will be huge. And so you don't want to have small determinant for the B Sobolev case. Actually, it's not that you do small determinant because uh, you are not very good. You do that because you have to. So if you take uh, the optimal things, uh, so if you do the best, well, the best you can do is to follow geodesics, basically. And since nothing here is convex, geodesics uh, are non-injective. Whenever you have a corner inside, all the geodesics around want to pass to the same point. You must be a diffeomorphism, and this means that uh, you are an infimum and not a minimum, because instead of passing everybody to the single point, they will make a small space to remain injective, but that's just to remain injective. The norm doesn't care. Uh, but for the norm of the inverse, uh, it's a disaster. So you don't have to follow geodesics. So let me list uh, a very simple question about extensions. Too simple. Take an injective function, even smooth if you prefer, from the boundary of the square to R2, and consider a function u which is uh, with phi as boundary value and which is minimizing the W1 to L, the W1P norm, if you want P equal to, no difference. So my question is, can you say that u is smooth? Well, if you studied at least up to this, second or third year at the university, you say, yeah, obviously, uh, even without phi smooth. Well, if I here add even the W12 norm of u minus one, uh, the problem is that, uh, uh, as far as I know, nobody has an idea of that. So even if phi is uh, a perfect one, unless you are in a specific case, so if phi is the identity, when well, okay, the identity is minimizing. But if phi is very nice and you want to minimize, then L2 norm of the U plus the L2 norm of the U minus one, you can prove easily by lower semi-continuity that the minimizer, that a minimizer exists. If it is smooth, you have no idea. But even worse, I can ask you, okay, I don't want to be a minimizer. Can you tell me that there is no Laurentian phenomenon? So can you tell me that the infimum of the energy among smooth functions is the same as the minimum among Bisobolev? Again, no idea. And even if I give you with a, a multiplicative constant, you will be happy even to say that the infimum with smooth functions is at most 10 times the minimum. Again, this is not known, which is crazy. So whenever I think about that, I say, no, no, there must be a trivial proof in alpha page. Maybe there is, but uh, I still didn't find it. And my collaborators even. Which is a problem, and so we can conclude saying that so basically, even the simplest lemma, so even the things which are the simplest and the trivial ones in the Sobolev case are completely open. The point is even gluing functions is something you cannot do. So you are not able to do because whenever you glue, you have to be careful near the segment and near the segment is nothing for you, but it is very important for you minus one. And so for instance, you cannot even, so even if you take a Lebesgue point of the U not with zero determinant. Take a back point x for the u with the u of x, the identity. You cannot even replace a u with the identity in a small neighborhood, so, which is uh, the simplest part uh, when you are Sobolev and non bisobolev So this is the, the most trivial step there. And even uh, another thing which was step, step zero, so, so it was step two in the slide uh, seven, I guess, so, which was, okay, take your boundary value and make it uh, piecewise linear. You take a curve and you make it piecewise linear, who cares? You can do this. This is another thing that you are not able to do in the Bisobolev case. Well, of course, if you make a very small corner, this is not a smart idea. But you would like to say, okay, I'm not stupid. I have a curve, I make this curve without small corners, piecewise linear, and, uh, well, this is again something which seems really trivial, but we cannot do that. The point is that the problem dislikes linearity. So even if you tell me to do the best, you are linear here and linear there, do the best thing. In the W1P case, the best thing is remain linear. In the Bisobolev case, the best is not that. So if the two segments are small and you remain small, you pay a lot of energy for the inverse. So you will do something like the non-convex geodesics of this morning. But you have no idea what are they a priori. So 
Alessio. You did something up to now, try to do something even better, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Aldo. Are there questions, comments? Have you thought about approximating the inverse and the mapping to different sequence which, which the composition of them converge into the identity in some weaker norm? Ooh, yes, I tried. So the problem is that, so it is also written somewhere here, I think. So the problem is that uh, in this case, so, ah, okay, you don't see that, but okay. Uh, a difficulty here is that uh, the lower semi-continuity plays uh, half of the time for you and half of the time against you. And, uh, well, if you are playing against the lower semi-continuity, it's not a fair game. So, uh, then I don't know what to do. So, if you, uh, we try to play with uh, sequences, uh, and, well, actually, part of the convergence goes as you expect, and part of the convergence says that, uh, in the end, it's worse. So, you are the sum of a lower and sum of an upper semi-continuous part. And then even playing with sequences uh, is something we tried, but uh, up to now with no thing. So it was very difficult for me to write uh, the, the slides, so I canceled and rewrite the slides up to half an hour ago, so one hour and a half ago, because basically whenever I write these things, I say, no, no, okay, wait, wait. At least uh, this thing is obvious, and then I stopped writing the slides several times in the last week to say, no, at least this lemma I can prove, and I could not. So. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank Aldo again, and then we have a coffee break. <laughs>